morning. Welcome to Berlin. Welcome to EDSSI L2 conference. We have a fantastic day ahead of us. EDSSI L2 stands for the European Digital Student Service Infrastructure Level 2. And we are here today to share the results of the project. The project was funded by the European Commission through the digital, uh, the Connecting Europe Facility Program and has the objective of streamlining the digital infrastructure underpinning the education, the European educational area by establishing a seamless management system for the use of the e-card at higher education level. We have a fantastic panel today. We have different sessions. We will be looking at the e-cards and the role of the e-cards moving forward, um, especially from the perspective of the administration and the student administration. We will be looking at the higher education institution perspective. We also have the policy makers. So we have via video link um, policy officers from DG Connect that will give us a perspective of the policy landscape of the European student card, of the infrastructure underpinning its uh, adoption and, and, uh, and use. We also have very interesting perspectives from the side of the service providers. So we are looking at the different angles of what this infrastructure, this digital infrastructure can look like in terms of adoption of the ESC moving forward. So we have different keywords for the day, European educational area, European student card, digital infrastructure, higher education institutions, international offices. And it's great that we have this opportunity today to discuss this at length and in depth. This conference is meant to be not a one way where a one-way process where the project simply presents the results. It's really meant to be an exchange among practitioners. And it's very um, in interesting to see that we have a fantastic audience today as well. We also have service providers, students organizations, card providers, and higher education institution representatives from different angles. So I think that we have all the brain power to move forward and also ask questions. So this is the great opportunity for us to present the results of the project, but also for the audience to raise concerns, um, questions, and because that's the only way we can find solutions together. So this is uh, what we will be looking at during the day. We have a packed agenda. As you can see, we have different panels where we'll be looking at the different angles. Um, a few caveats. First of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Lorenzo Costantino. I'm uh, a governance uh, and uh, advocacy officer with Fondazione Diso. Fondazione Diso is an Italian national foundation uh, looking at the higher education journey of students with a focus on provision of support uh, services for students. And Fondazione Indizu is also a pride, proud partner of the EDSSI L2 project. And uh, we're very happy uh, to be here today with this fantastic crowd, both in the panels and in the audience. A few logistical aspects for the day. Uh, you can get a Wi-Fi connection with your EduRom uh, system or connecting with the free city Wi-Fi of Berlin. Uh, municipality. Um, a few caveats, legal disclaimer, we will be taking pictures for dissemination and visibility purposes. If you have anything against being uh, photographed for the day, please let us know and let uh, Deborah know. Also, for any sort of uh, information or request, you can always relate to the staff we have a group of volunteers, and uh, so this is also an opportunity to thank them wholeheartedly for the fantastic work that I've been uh, uh, performing to put this together and make it happen today. Uh, going back to the agenda, as you can see, we will also have a light coffee break. We will also have a lunch break. 
with a light sandwich break. Those are great opportunities to brainstorm, to keep networking, and to keep talking to each other and exchanging notes. So we look at it really as a um, collaborative and a two-way uh, process for the day. Um, I want to uh, welcome uh, Tamas Molnar, who is uh, here today to welcome us on behalf of Humboldt University uh, of Berlin. Uh, Tamas is the head of unit of the Campus Card Initiative, among other things, of course. And uh, he's giving us the welcome speech on behalf of Malte Dreyer, who could not be here with us today. And thank you, Tamas. Welcome. Thank you, Lorenzo. Um, obviously, I'm not Malta Dreyer. Um, unfortunately, he uh, did have an accident yesterday and could not make it today. So he asked me to um, do the welcome speech. Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome to this very historic place. Um, this room you are in is the uh, oldest building still standing in Berlin. Um, as a complete building. It was built in the 14th century as a chapel for a um, hospital for a um, called Heiliggeist uh, Hospital um, and was then later incorporated into the building next to us, which is the Faculty of Economics of the Humboldt University. The Humboldt University was founded in 1809, so it's not one of the oldest universities in Germany, but it is um, among the 20 largest universities in, in Germany. Um, we have 38,000 students um, this semester, or almost 38,000. And um, we are what we call in Germany a full Universität. That means we um, have almost everything, um, apart from um, engineering and medical sciences. Um, we used to have those two um, until the fall of the war. Um, Humboldt, the Humboldt University had also had engineering, and until the um, late 90s, we also had um, a medical faculty, which has now been um, created from the medical faculties from the so a separate university-like something. Um, not even lawyers know what it is. Um, um, it it um, is something like a university, the Charité, which has been created um, from the medical faculties of the Humboldt Universität and the Freie Universität. Um, if you were um, here yesterday, so at our conference um, or a training, um, we were in the Campus Nord, one of the other campuses of the Humboldt University. We have, a, we have three. And if you were here in, uh, on Monday um, at the consortium meeting, we were at the Natural Sciences Campus, this is in Adlershof. So we have in Adlershof the Natural Sciences, the Campus Nord, together with the Charité, the Life Sciences, and this one is the Social Sciences and Humanities. Um, and if you still have time after, the, um, after today's conference, um, please visit our main building. It's like a 10 minute walk from here through the Museum Sinsel behind us. It's also a very beautiful walk, we can walk um, next to the old muse museums, um, those are also, if you have time to the, tomorrow, for example, um, please visit the museums, they are fascinating. Um, yes, um, the Humboldt Universität, like I said, was founded in, in 1809 and um, was called Friedrich Wilhelm Universität um, after its uh, founder, one of the Prussian kings, um, and this name was used until the end of the war uh, when it was rechristened Humboldt Universität and also uh, split up because the Humboldt Universität was, we are now in the, what was the Eastern Germany. So, um, and um, the part of the Universität who did not really want to be in Eastern Germany went to, to West Berlin, then West Berlin, um, and therefore the Freie Universität exists. That's also why their name is Freie Universität, so Free University, because the professors and faculty of the Humboldt University at that time who did not want to cooperate with the Soviets uh, went to West Berlin and founded a new university. Um, that's why we in Berlin have three large universities. Um, uh, we have Humboldt University, where you now are, the Freie Universität and the uh, University of Technology. And um, together with all the smaller universities, we have a student population in Berlin of almost 200,000 students. Um, this is a not even a small city, but a me medium city. 
um, and um, the campus card, um, which I'm the head of unit four, um, incorporates from these 200,000 about 150,000 students and thereby we are the largest unified student ID system in Europe. So um, again, uh, I would like to thank all volunteers, so my team, especially Christine, who was uh, the major force organizing this conference. Um, she's next to the door, so if you have any questions about the conference, uh, you can ask her. Um, and also all other members of my team, some of them who man currently the registration desk, um, and one of them who is sitting next to your bags and, and that no, no one's bag is getting stolen today. Um, um, many thanks to them. Uh, without them, this conference would not have happened. Um, and also thank you for the audience that you have come to Berlin. Uh, I hope you will have a great day um, and um, go home with a lot of knowledge, uh, a lot of new ideas and can network here with other people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tamash, for the uh, warm welcome. And uh, can I please ask you to stay behind because you are a member of the next panel. And this is very interesting what you just mentioned, that you represent the largest unified court system for students. So uh, a wealth of knowledge and experience and case studies and lessons learned that we can all draw from. Let me invite the rest of the um, panelists uh, to the podium in order of appearance. We have Joachim uh, Whistling. He's the deputy executive manager at the European University Foundation. And then we have Licia Florio coming up to stage. Um, she's a senior strategy manager at NordUNET. Um, and we will also have the pleasure of having Stefan Lichstrom, who works for the Swedish NREN Sunnet as a service manager for the e-signature. The purpose of the panel today is really to look at the evolution of the European Digital uh, uh, Student Service Infrastructure, what it is, and how we got here. So we will start with Joachim Whistling, and Joachim will uh, probably come up to stage here, and Joachim will give us a sense of what is the background, what is the rationale, what is the motivation behind the wish to establish this infrastructure, digital infrastructure. Thank you very much. Yes, good morning, can you hear me? Thank you, yes, slides, exactly. So here we go, and that would be my... Thank you very much for the introduction, Lorenzo. Um, good morning from my side as well. Uh, my name is indeed Joachim Wissling. I do represent here the European University Foundation, which is a network of higher education institutions. We are about 80 higher education institutions, and our objective is to contribute to the modernization of the European higher education area. So we have a few missions, and one of the missions is to actually work in the context of digitalization, of student mobility, of inter internationalization of higher education institutions. Um, I actually do represent here today two colleagues. The first one is Juan Baslar. He is our executive manager. He has been very, very much following the EDSSI L2 project as well. And he could not be here today because he's outside of Europe attending a conference. And I'm also representing Aniko. He has, she has been our coordinator for the um, EDSSI L2 project, but she's on a maternity leave. So I just wanted to um, say that, um, yes, these two actually were the, the main persons. I was very much involved with Tamas when we wrote the proposal at the beginning, so I'll give you a bird's eye view of what is the context, the background, how we actually came into building this L2 uh, project proposal. But before we start with my presentation, I just would like to see a raise of hands. Um, who is representing uh, universities in this room? Raise of hands. Okay, like what I would say 50% probably, yes, universities. Who is representing service providers? So third parties, um, companies, firms that work in the field of higher education. So we have what, two only? No more, I, I, I think I saw three. Who is representing um, also student service providers? So I think in Dizu, in France, we have CNUS, yes, in the back over there, okay, good. So I would say that we have about 50% of higher education institutions in this room and then probably, um, well, third party service providers. From those that said that you are from universities, who is representing an international vision office? Okay, so I would say half of it, all right. 
Who is representing IT staff? So IT departments. All right. Well, that's even more. Good. Interesting. Um, what I wanted to say is that we have a very diverse um, group here in this room, which means that you represent either universities or third party service providers, public institutions that work in the field of higher education. But within the universities, we also have international relations offices and IT staff members. And traditionally, these two departments don't talk too much uh, very often um, to, to each other. And this type of project is actually an opportunity to also connect international relations, internationalization of higher education institutions, and these IT departments which are supporting student life. Good. Um, well, I'll delve into the, to my topic so that we don't, we're not really running too late. So as a background, I wanted to tell you that, well, I would say over the last decades, maybe even more, we have seen that we have rapidly growing number of mobile students in Europe. So the population that is actually going ab abroad for a degree or for a short-term credit mobility is increasing rapidly. And when we actually look at the figures, the budget envelope of the Erasmus Plus program, you can see that the multi-annual financial frameworks decided by the European Union for the last three multi-annual financial frameworks, the budget allocated to the Erasmus Plus program has been steadily increasing, close to actually, I would say, uh, yeah, increase of 40-50% every time. Um, a new multi-annual financial framework was approved. Which also means that the commitment from the European institutions towards internationalization, towards mobility of students, towards increasing cooperation and deepening ties between higher education institutions is very high. And when you actually look at the latest Eurostat numbers that I found on the, on the World Wide Web, um, in 2020 we have 1.48 million students that study abroad in one of the European countries. This figure includes both degree-seeking degree -seeking students and credit mobility students. And actually, the second cohort, which is probably the ones that we have been working most with, is uh, the ones that take a short-term credit mobility, like a semester mobility abroad. So this cohort is 440,000 euros in 2020. And, well, you can see the distribution um, per, per country. This is probably... Uh, the, the, the students we are most interested in, in the context of the digitalization that we are undergoing at the European Student Card Initiative. Uh, but we can also see that then this will have a spillover and the benefit for also degree-seeking students that enroll for studies abroad. Having said this, I'll briefly give you uh, some information about the policy context in which this project has been operating. So the first thing I wanted to say is that since 2017, we have started talking about what we call the European education area. This is something that has been initiated by the social summit of EU heads of states in Gothenburg in 2017. And out of this, well, of course, formally, the European education area was approved only two years later by the European Commission with a specific uh, communication and agenda. But the sort of the political impetus to actually get this going was 2017. Out of this came two specific initiatives that I want to mention in the context of the European Education Area. Of course, there's much more, but specifically today, two initiatives are probably most interesting for us. The first one I want to mention is the European University Initiative. So nowadays we have about, I think, over 400,000 high, no, sorry, 400 higher education institutions that are involved in a European University Initiative, which looks actually at deepening cooperation, ties, and mobility, between a certain group of higher education institutions. And probably most of you in this room have heard about it or are actually closely already involved in one of these initiatives. What I want to mention here is that um, there is a political a policy goal that has been given to this initiative, which is to have 50% of student mobility within a European university initiative. The best that I have seen, let's say on average, is 20% of student mobility within higher education institutions. There is one exception, actually we have a representative in this room, where, well, we go close to 90% of student mobility, but that's an exception, I think, for, for European countries, uh, which is actually Luxembourg, where student mobility is uh, mandatory. And, uh, but yeah, for, 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 let's say, for the top performing institution, usually we reach, at best, 20%, and I think average is more around 11, 12%. Um, the second initiative is the European Student Card Initiative, which has two components. On one side, the European Student Card Initiative looks at digitizing the data transactions between higher education institutions to support student mobility processes. 
and I will go a bit deeper into this topic afterwards in my presentation. And the second part is the European Student Card. And the European Student Card actually gave its name to the European Student Card Initiative as such. But there's, yeah, beyond the Student Card, there's also this um, digital data transaction context. Um, for probably those working in the field of IT, this slide will look very familiar, but I just wanted to highlight it also one, one more time, which is the fact that since 2014, the EIDAS regulation is in place and is being deployed, and that means that uh, the European Union and its member states are looking to facilitate, uh, well, data transaction across borders for services, for um, uh, commercial purposes, but also for public services, and in that sense, Licia, Stefan, you probably will touch more on, on the topic of EIDAS uh, later on. Well, now, more specifically, <clears throat> the journey towards uh, digital transformation. I'll give you now this bird's eye view that I spoke about of what has been done in the context of the partners that are involved in DDSSI projects up to, up to now. So, what we did first in 2014 is that we started digitizing the Erasmus Plus learning agreements which for those that do not, are not familiar with the context of student mobility, every student that goes abroad for a credit mobility, a short-term mobility, needs to sign a learning agreement. And, well, when we actually started looking into this in 2012, 2013, what the International Relations Offices told us is that this is more or less a nightmare because uh, every student has to sign it and we have to send it by email, sometimes by a post, we have to sign it on paper. So it's sort of a, um, a process that also afterwards probably needs in most of the cases, updating because the courses change. So what we said, okay, let's start with that. And that was sort of a revolution because we suddenly started using electronic signatures whereby, like if you receive a parcel from UPS, you would sign um, with your hand on the screen the learning agreement. And that for a lot of institutions, that was already sort of a step ahead. Well, from a digital perspective, from an electronic perspective, this was probably not enough. And Stefan will uh, talk more about the e-signature process uh, right afterwards. But yeah, that was a leap forward and we already faced um, yeah, quite of discussions at that point. So that was the OLA project, which was a platform that pioneered it. Uh, but in the context of the digitization of student data to be exchanged between higher education institutions, uh, we worked since 2015 on the Erasmus Without Paper project. Um, we had, I think, two EU-funded projects specifically on Erasmus with our paper between 2015 and 2019. Then we also worked in the context of the two EDSSI projects on Erasmus with our paper. And nowadays this is part of a framework contract, so since 2022, a framework contract uh, with the European Commission to actually enable the European Student Card Initiative on the side of this uh, data transaction. So what I wanted to mention is that the ULA that I mentioned just before, the online learning agreements, is a platform that allows you to, to digitize these learning agreements, but that can also be done through Erasmus Without Paper, whereby you can use your own system, adopt the data transaction standards defined in Erasmus Without Paper, and exchange it with the systems of your partner institutions. So Erasmus Without Paper, in a nutshell, and I won't go into detail because it's not the topic of today's conference, allows you to digitize presently some of the key steps of student mobility, and we hope in the future that this will be extended to all of the steps that are needed uh, to complete actually student mobility. I also wanted to mention the uh, piloting of the European Student Card Project because some of the partners here in this room were involved in the first era European Student Card Project that actually gave the name to the European Student Card Initiative in 2017. So that was an initiative bottom-up driven, started by the community with intention to actually build a European student card, conferring to the students a European status, so that when they go abroad, for whatever reason, personal, for studies, they would be able to access student services like canteens, libraries, with their home university account, uh, card, sorry. And that means that when we started discussing this, a whole, what's well, so a Pandora box was opened because then we started facing a whole lot, a new series of issues of technologies of what services uh, can be accessed to. Um, yeah, this, this project was led by the French student service provider, Cos. just wanted to mention that as well. In 2017, we started working on a mobile app. This is the Erasmus Plus mobile app, um, which was launched for the 30th anniversary of the Erasmus Plus program. And uh, nowadays, the intention is to make this 
the single access point for students into the Erasmus Plus mobility experience. So that a student basically can complete all the different steps from considering to going abroad, from actually applying to going abroad, from signing the learning agreements, from receiving a transcript of records when you return at home, to maybe even receiving a notification that your credits that you earned abroad have been recognized, uh, that you could do that as a student from your Erasmus Plus mobile app. And of course, you can see these are all separately driven, bottom-up built projects, so there has been a need to actually drive Convergence, and this is where the EDSSI projects first came in since 2019 with intention to drive um, yeah, conversions. So 2019, something else I wanted to mention is the, uh, the objective uh, at that point to drive convergence to, for the identification of the students across all these multiple digitization initiatives that we were seeing popping up left and right. And this is when we started working notably with Gion on the question of how do we uh, coherently, persistently, uniquely identify students using an existing network, Edugain, and that led to the creation of my Community ID. But again, Licia, you will introduce the, the participants today much more into the technical details of my Community ID as such. Um, yeah, that was, that was, I think, a big step forward because this combines both the university world and the EIDAS world, so what DG Connect, the Connecting Europe facility program was building on their side. So I think that was, that was a great way forward. And since 2020, yes, that's what I mentioned, we, have the, we had first the EDSSI L1 and nowadays the EDSSI L2 project. We have been working on actually bringing all these projects that I mentioned together under one roof and looking at making this a more coherent experience for both students but also higher education institutions and uh, service providers. Quick overview, and I'm almost done, Lorenzo. Um, it is Sal project, L1 project. We worked on further developing Erasmus with our paper network. So at that point, we moved on from the specific funding projects, project funding that we had up to 2019, to further develop Erasmus with our paper and drive the, uh, the well, greater level of maturity of the infrastructure. Then we looked into deploying the European Student Identifier, my Community ID, and the so-called IDP of last resort. Licia. I'll not say more about this, right? Um, and then we also worked on what we call the student service provider model, with the intention that a student should have access to information of what are the services that are available in various cities slash high education institutions across Europe. So when you decide to go abroad for whatever short-term or long-term mobility that you, under, will, that you want to undertake, what are the student services that are available abroad? And can I actually access those with, in the future, hopefully, the European student card, so to make that proving of inf information available earlier. This uh, provider module is a prototype, and we hope that once the Erasmus with our paper network has been stabilized, we'll be able to add that as well, so that uh, we take a step-by-step -step <laughs> approach. EDSSIL2 looked into, I would say, new components of the whole digital digitalization ad adventure. The first one, the e-card, and Tamas, you're the project coordinator, and I think that has been the biggest part of the EDSSIL2 project with the intention of actually, instead of just looking at the European student card objective of giving the status a European dimension to student status, doing that through an e-card so that you basically over, you forego the technical, technology, technological interoperability issues that a student card faces when you go to another institution, be it uh, yeah, chip, NFC driven, QR codes whatsoever. Tamas will say more. E-signature, that is going to be for Stefan. So we were looking into this Ceph building block to actually upgrade also the signature functionality, for example, for the OLA, the online learning agreement. But also, if in the future we have higher trust in the signatures, maybe we could digitize grant agreements for students and then automatize the grant transfer to the students so that there are no delays anymore for students to receive their grant to make inclusion a higher objective. Then we had two building blocks, e-archive, e-translate, and one more slide. Um, from, from, the, from the CEF uh, digital infrastructure and we looked into the feasibility of actually using that in the context of Erasmus with our paper for e-archive. And for e-translate, my personal favorite would be that we are actually able to translate the online course catalogs, for example, of the institution. So that as a student, you cannot just 
read these in the local language or in English language, but you could also automatically translate them in the local language. And then we also worked on the housing platform because we know that access to housing is one of the top three issues for students to go abroad. In a nutshell, L1 and L2 allowed us to drive convergence between bottom-up initiatives that have been developed by the community, adopt slash consider CEF digital Europe building blocks to support this digitalization process, also advance the digitalization process underway in the Erasmus Plus program, Erasmus with our paper and so on, link up with other initiatives like the European Student Card, and support, and most importantly probably, support the digital change, but digital change also means cultural change, because we cannot just transfer analog um, business processes into digital tools, we very often have to actually also adopt the way we implement this in, in, in digital tools. So this has been uh, yeah, one of the goals as well of the L2 projects. That would be it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Joachim. This is the uh, best introductory um, presentation. Uh, you have given us an all, or a whole overview of the evolution. Uh, what is very interesting, just a few takeaways. Um, internationalization, policy and budgetary commitment from the European Commission. Uh, the big elephant in the room, this is here to happen. Uh, it's a process that started with the digitalization of ID for citizens, for governments, etc. in 2014, then in 2017, the European Commission planted the seed of the European educational area. By 2025, the clock is ticking. And then thanks also for uh, guiding us through this process of the My Academic ID, the ESC, the Erasmus Without Paper. And then you look at it, the European Digital Student Service Infrastructure, L1, L2 projects, are really the glue, the platform that brings all of these together. So thank you again, Joachim. Feel free, again, anytime you have comments, questions, concerns, this is really about bringing all the stakeholders together. And uh, Joachim, I would like to make the transition to the next presentation with something you mentioned. It's not simply embedding technology to switch from analog to digital. It's change management, it's a cultural approach for everybody involved, the universities, the students, the service providers, and everybody else. So we are all in it together, and we can only come up together with it. Let me invite Licha up to stage, and Licha will give us a sense of the evolution of the European Digital Student Service infrastructure. Thank you very much. I think I'll use this because Italians may need the hands, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so thanks for having me. My name is Licia Florio. Uh, probably many of you still remember me working for Geant, where I've been for 20 years, where I was for 20 years, actually. And as of March, I moved to Nordunet, which is an organization that is a member of Geant. So I still, I'm still in the family, just moved with Nordic's cousins, so to speak. Um, I'm here to report about the work that has been done uh, together, well, mostly by my colleague, Christos Kanelopoulos, who, who cannot be here, and also I, by myself, as I've been involved in all projects until EDSSI 2. So what I would like to talk today about is really about the journey, um, about the authentication journey, because as Joaquin has set out the the scenes very well, when you start changing from the paper process to the electronic process, uh, the first thing that you will uh, uh, encounter is how do I authenticate my students? How do they know who they are, etc. And actually, they came with some solutions already. Google was there, I mean, of course, and it's, it's a good way. However, one of the things that are important when you try to access uh, the Erasmus program is that you need to understand that I'm Licha, and that's okay, anybody can vouch for me, my government, Google, whoever, but still, you want to know that I'm a student at University of Berlin, and I want to go to the University of Rome, for instance, or wherever, and this data have to be correlated, so this is the important part. Now, let's look a little bit at what was there when we started, right? We were, maybe everything happened at the right moment in a way because things we could build on what was there already. So as you can see, there was this big push of Erasmus Plus and that sets the scenes and the pressure by, you know, also 
the political pressure to invest into this uh, uh, new di digitalization. Uh, there was a, a DAWP infrastructure. There, there's been, this has been, for me, really a major um, bottom-up approach with universities coming together, defining a, a massive network with APIs, with everything, connecting providers. So it, it, this is really remarkable for me, also considering the limited funding that were available for that. So that was there. And then the ESI came along with, the, um, uh, the, with this really initiative. So also the, the, uh, not only um, the economical support, but also the political support to go ahead. And there was this roadmap that, I mean, I'm focusing only on the first things because it's, uh, it was more, uh, uh, let's say, on our shoulders the pressure to manage, by 2021, uh, the deadline to manage the online learning agreement, and 2022 to manage the interinstitutional agreements. So we are looking at 2019. So when you think, oh my God, this is gonna happen tomorrow, right? Um, luckily, uh, we could, uh, we had existing infrastructures there, one more, um, well, tailored for the academics, EduGain, which is basically the infrastructure that aggregates the national research and identity federations that are operating in each country for research and education purposes, uh, and they aggregate into EduGain, and EduGain is a, a global infrastructure, not only for Europe, it covers all, uh, all, all world effectively, including US, Asia, uh, uh, Australia, and so on. Um, and on the other end, we had the EDAS, which you heard from Joachim, 2014 was the date where it, it started really to be, there was push on the member states to, uh, to, to make that happen. And in fact, over time, some countries have progressed a lot, and there are uh, now in countries like uh, Italy, for instance, uh, Luxembourg, Spain, and a few others. I mean, I, I don't have the access, exhaustive list, but you can use your national EID, which is compliant with EADAS, to log in into the uh, online learning agreement, for instance. So this was really the, the, the starting point. So what EduGain provides uh, is important. It's not only an, an infrastructure to say this is person X, but it says this is a student at University X, and this is important for Erasmus purposes. What EADAS does, it, it, it tells you this is a person that the voucher, that the government can voucher for, so it even increased the level of trust that you can have in the uh, authentication vetting that is done by the government. So, um, with all this together, we thought we need to have an infrastructure that uses what's there, and then we came up with my academic ID, which you have seen this, this picture, probably many of you have seen this picture, and looks kind of simple, but I can trust you, I can assure you that this required almost one year of long, long meetings, and I, when I say long, means that really at some point we were kicked out from the buildings because the security had to close the building, because we were trying really to understand each other, and we were trying to find a way how we could make things uh, as transparent as possible for those involved, because at the end you can design everything, but if it's too complex, nobody will be able to implement that. So what we did, basically, we, uh, the, 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 um, the infrastructure is operated as a service by Jeanne uh, and combines, allows students to log in with their EADAS uh, national ID, if they have one, uh, with, uh, with their academic credentials, uh, that are those that are provided to the students in the moment in which the students enrolls at university. Google is still there. Uh, we, we, we didn't want to disconnect, uh, uh, to, to break with the past. Um, and basically, it, it also um, uh, allows to transfer the uh, European student identifier. This was also a major milestone. You have to understand the identifier is something important because basically it allows to correlate uh, data that are produced at different points in time. At one point, the student enrolls, applies, then the student is accepted, then the student does exams, then the data are transferred between the, the organizations. So all this, the system has to keep track that the same user has produced this data and that this data are to be sent to the right university. So 
we built in, on the existing, there was a pre-existing European student identifier, which, I mean, the colleagues before clearly recognized the need of such an identifier. It was built though on using the peak number at the commission. The commission was in the process of changing those. So we thought that's a good opportunity to use something that the universities are already using. And that was why we looked at the Shark Home Organization Code, which was something that uh, was already being used in the context of uh, EWP. So this said, the, um, we went into production in November 2020, so it means that then we had zero users because it was really the cutoff. Then there was, of course, Christmas. Um, um, and at that point, basically, if you will, we, the, the real usage started as of January 2021, when everybody was back from uh, the, the, the Christmas break. Uh, we did realize that although um, most of the universities are connected to a, to a national federation and therefore to EDUGAIN, there are still cases where universities are not uh, federated. Different uh, cases. Some universities are maybe not real universities, so they don't follow under the remit of the National uh, Research and Education Network. Uh, there are some private universities, there are some universities that for, te for whatever reasons don't, don't, don't fit the bill. And then we worked with DGAC to identify a way how we could serve those, because obviously we could not leave people behind when we were trying to digitalize everything. And what we came up with was um, a, a system, basically, that allows us to... Um, on board the university, so to, to, to create on my academic ID a sort of a virtual uh, organization for these universities that are not federated and to basically, uh, for them to manage their own uh, students. Typically these universities are smaller because bigger universities are somehow federated. So, but still, we, when we started, to, to launch this, uh, this system. It was in 2021. We ended up with 300, almost 400 uh, institutions, which, I mean, if you look at the data that Joachim presented, is not the majority, but still, it is a lot to deal with, 400 uh, organizations. And we worked really with DGAC, so how do we know that uh, those universities need support? We, uh, DGAC has the HR list, you, you probably you know better than me how this process works, and we look at, uh, we, we get this list updated periodically by DGAC, and we compare the, the, the list of the institutions that with the list of the institutions that are in EduGain. We also double check with countries, for instance, with the Federation of Operators, say, hey, is this true that this university is there? Not, sometimes there are false positives, sometimes, you know, so we have to correct that. And then for those that, the, the, the let's say, the, the validated uh, white list that we get, is then uh, we onboard that on the IDP or last resort. So, and by the way, just to be very sure, our goal, and I'm speaking on behalf of Jantia, is really to, see the number decreasing. So ideally, we don't want to see uh, institution on ADP or last resort. Our goal is not to see the number growing, but the contrary. The success story will be, we have zero institution there, so, and we can phase out the ADP or last resort because it means that people are using other things. But for the time being, it's there. Um, in addition to what we did, we also mob mobilized the, the, our contacts in the in 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 the um, in the in, in different countries, and some of them actually received national funding to address their problem nationally, and that's because you know they felt this was an important thing, and they had several uh, universities, also private school, you know, a higher school like. A conservatorium in Italy, for instance, uh, uh, art schools that are not really universities but still are, are, uh, are, are part of Erasmus+. Plus. And you can see here the status of the IDP or last resort. Um, France, it's a, a major complex country because they have a lot of high schools and they also are split under different ministries. Uh, so some of the ministries have already created an IDP or last resort for their 
our institutions, but now we are working with Renater to cover the others. So it's complicated, but uh, work is in progress. And actually Renater is now looking at the code that is being used to operate, to, to run the Adipio Last Resort in Spain to build their national solution. So, um, um, so I think this is all positive to see also the local engagement there. And we track stats uh, of institutions that are connected to see how far they are, etc. So uh, we, we, will, uh, we will provide also, we, we have some plans in the summer to really start looking at each countries, how they did, what was challenging, and share those uh, stories with the others. So, um, moving forward, after all this was in place, we thought, I mean, th there was further de development ongoing on the Erasmus Plus infrastructure, and one of the things was the, um, the EWP registry that was rolled out, and the idea of the registry is really to, um, uh, to op optima optimize the, um, the, the way how these manifest files are handled. Don't ask me exactly about the manifest files because I'm not the expert. Maybe you are somebody else can say more. But um, uh, this is the important thing is that those uh, the, this this tool is is not uh, student facing. is really used by the universities to uh, be part to basically create their own node on the Erasmus Plus network. And the idea was to really reduce the manual intervention and do as much as online. And for doing that, we thought, okay, but who is the administrator of this? You need to define this role. So we worked with uh, the, um, the, the people that are managing the WP node, the University of Warsaw and, uh, and others. And we came up with this <coughs> EWP, <coughs> excuse me, administrator role. Uh, that is uh, released as an entitlement from the ADP for to allow basic to to enable the authorization of the WP administrator on the on on the tool. So this is now enabled. There are all the specifications online for those of you that are more geeks and want to see the specifications. Uh, this has been now enabled for those administrators that belong to institutions that are federated. Um, obviously, the same applies for uh, uh, sorry, the same applies for those that are not federated, and we have to look. Uh, we we are looking into that to allow also those administrators to access everything online. So um, th this is basically all the things that have happened. The funding was uh, uh, done obviously for my academic ID, uh, uh, the, the bootstrap my academic ID project. Then all the uh, additional work was done under EDSSI 1, and under EDSSI 2, uh, there was part of the work done, uh, and then at some point the Commission launched the, the two procurements, as uh, some of the work, all the operations and further enhancement of my, my academic ID have been moved out of the EDSSI 2 for double funding uh, problems, obviously, and are continuing though under the FPA. So the 2023, what's left to do? Well, there is still some work uh, to do, as I said. Uh, first of all, we are pushing uh, the, um, the ESI, the release of the ESI. There was a lot of discussion whether there should be a mandatory deadline, whether not. Um, and I mean, there are pros and cons for all, for all these things, how people want to operate via gentle push or brute force. That's always the question, but we are really uh, thinking of, of more campaigning for to, to make DSI uh, as much as possible deployed. And actually, I have to say there are countries where there is 100% release of DSI. Croatia is one of that. Hungary is one of that. Um, the, uh, Norway is one of that. So there are a few things uh, that are happening there for. Maybe they were in an easier position, but, but there are countries where this is happening, and we want to push the other countries to, to get, well, maybe if not 100%, but at least 90% of that. Um, the, um, uh, via the FPA, the, the framework uh, contract, we are looking at uh, a new announcement for the whole EWP network. There, there is the idea of revamping the whole network to 
allow for better scalability and um, different API management for the providers, some different supporting tools. There is a document that's now uh, still private. Um, we share that with the commission and we, we need to discuss more, but uh, there will be some information that comes out from there. Um, we also want to continue the work on DWP administrator. This will be a massive work because uh, we need to really make sure that all these uh, users can access online, can access the registry online. Uh, and this will require, uh, I think we will get other probably 400 institution or maybe some there is some overlap but still we need to add the, the new role there so this is the work that will be is, is being looked at uh, and we have to find uh, um, we, we have to roll out this soon and lastly um, I just want to say so as you can see basically in a few years we covered a lot of ground and this was because we were really a great team. Uh, we had lots of divergency view, the, the divergent views, but maybe that helped <laughs> because at the end uh, we could find what we felt was the best possible way forward at the time. Um, and we could build on what was there already. So just to give you a sense about the colors, the things that are in white, uh, the boxes that are white colored are those boxes where we as a community, the, the SSI2 community, the universities, have a saying in the governance and we can, we can act on them, we can push things. Obviously, EADAS is something that's something we cannot do, it's the government. I mean, some of you may have good relationship with the government, not all of us, so it is what it is, so we can benefit from what is there. Under EDSSI 2, as, as the project was more focused on adding new services, new additional services that would be useful for the, the digitalization of the program, uh, EDUSign was connected to My Academic ID, so that can be also accessed in a federated manner. So now all the services for EWP network are connected and can be accessed in a federated manner. Um, the um, uh, additional work that uh, we are looking at also, this is we as Geant, uh, on the Geant side and the NRNs is the University Alliances. Um, as Joachim mentioned, there, is, there, there are many alliances uh, <laughs> that, that are being formed and they will need similar solution to enable federated access to their students. So, uh, it would be useful if we could prevent uh, uh, another wheel to be reinvented, basically. So, um, the other thing also that is happening right now, and maybe some of you have heard about that, there is already since a few years the European Blockchain Service Infrastructure, if the acronym is correct. This is again something driven by the member states to create this, uh, probably on the hyper blockchain, to create this uh, infrastructure. Uh, it's, uh, it's a, they use a private ledger, so it's not a, a public uh, blockchain. But uh, uh, there are some use cases that they are looking at. One is the education one, and there is work done by some colleagues of mine in Jean to profile my academic ID, so they, there could be a possibility to exchange information over the EBSI ledger. And this is work on prog in progress and is funded via this project called DC for EU. And lastly that I have is, <clears throat> there is also, you probably have heard about the wallets. Uh, I mean, everybody uses wallets nowadays, of course, for everything. So why not having a wallet for students where they can put their grades, their information, their certification, they can exchange those as needed. So um, there is, a, again, uh, this the, the DC4U project is pretty big, and actually Stefan is m more involved than me. I'm just marginally following up on that. Uh, but the, the idea is really um, uh, to um, uh, look at ways to uh, test with what we have done now and to, uh, to participate in one of the pilots for the education, basically, to have uh, um, one of the educational wallets. Um, so there is, as you can see, never a dull moment. Work continues. Um, and I hope the next time that we meet, we can tell you that uh, 
everybody is now fully digital and fully ready and that probably there is even a wallet, who knows. And that's all I have to say, so thanks for listening. Thank you, Licha. Uh, extremely informative and extremely ambitious. Just a quick uh, key takeaways. Um, I want to focus on a couple of key words. Transparency, reliability, portability, work in progress. We see that there is a high degree of fragmentation depending on where you are in Europe and also the issue of edu gain, um, uh, compliance or not. And this is very interesting, all the different pictures that you pop up. Um, any comments from the audience or questions? Or this is too early in the game. We have a question from the audience and probably we can um, throw the microphone. If you can um, uh, introduce yourself and tell us uh, which organization you represent today. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Sylvain Kieffer from University of Sorbonne. Okay. No. Maybe no. Yeah. <laughs> it's artificial intelligence. Yeah. So come on board. Yeah. Let's welcome the first uh, uh, participant asking a question. The icebreaker, please. Yeah, so uh, Sylvain Kieffer from the University of Sorbonne Paris now in the northern suburbs of Paris. Uh, I'm an integration engineer. My question is, there's quite a lot of information in this presentation. Is there um, any website or something where everything is um, summarized? where well, we can have um, information about each one of the projects you are mentioning here? Thank you. I'm sure there is an answer. We have an answer to that. Yeah. Uh, you want to give us the microphone back? Oh, oh it's with her. So, yes, actually there is a website. Maybe the starting point will be my Academic ID website. Um, I'll, uh, the slides, I presume, will be shared, so I'll put uh, references there. There is also more information, for instance, on the whitelist process. There is an annex with all the slides. There is a link to the ESI also there. There is a link to the AWP role. Um, so I think the starting point maybe is to, to look at the My Academic ID website, and then from there you will be sent to the right places. Uh, but I'll, I'll put a lot of slides with all the references. Uh, so you don't have to search, you can start from there. There are links already in the slides, but I'll, I'll collect them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this was extremely, extremely interesting. And now um, let me ask um, Tamas to join again and uh, share with us their experience and uh, interesting perspectives on how this is actually being implemented. Please. Thank you, Lorenzo. Um, Please not be in the correct order. Okay. Yeah, no. So, hi again. Um, um, let's talk about cards. So the second, the second leg um, of the EDSI project. Um, Licia told you about the infrastructure um, and um, also told you about the fragmentation of the um, in, in Europe, and the same is true for, for cards. Um, I am, the, as I told you, the, the head of unit for, uh, for the Campus Card Berlin, um, but I've also worked before as a project manager for the um, card system here, in, here at Humboldt to introduce a card system. And um, in 2017, 20, 2016, 2016, um, I got a call from my boss, um, who is not, today, not here today, but a call, call from him. Do you want to um, go to a meeting of the uh, European student card um, I have been invited to? 
um, let's look at that thing. Um, maybe it's interesting for us. So I went there and the rest is history, so to say. Um, I became involved in all these projects. Um, so um, we were at Humboldt, um, one of the uh, first members of this European student card community and also involved in the My Academic ID and EDSSI L1 and L2 projects, uh, mainly from the, from the student card perspective, um, from the student card technology perspective, but also from the service perspective, as the student cards um, have two sides. I, uh, one side is you give your students some kind of ID. They have to have some kind of ID to prove, okay, I'm a student. Um, and this ID has to be um, not only usable, um, so this would be the goal, that is not only usable at your campus, but if the student goes abroad, um, your student can have the student benefits um, and is accepted as a student. As it, and when you present your student card as a student in, abroad, um, they believe you that you are really a student, as this university you are coming from really exists. And as in uh, Europe there are hundreds of universities in different countries, and um, some of them with, let's just say, somewhat obscure names for, for um, foreigners. Um, it can happen, or it could have happened without, the, um, without these projects, that you present your student ID, whether it's a card or something else, uh, at a train station, for example, as a, as a student of a, of a university in Germany, uh, to a train station, train station, for example, in Hungary, and want to buy, wants to buy a ticket uh, as a student, and the, um, the operator says, um, no, I don't believe you that this university exists and that you're a student. You could have uh, printed this card at home. And um, this story um, actually happened to me as a student, as a PhD student, um, about 10 years ago, um, as a student of Humboldt University. And um, the, the, I wanted to buy a ticket, a train ticket in Hungary. And they said, okay, uh, you know what? I sell you the ticket, but if the conductor doesn't believe you, you get fined. Yeah, uh, long story short, there was no conductor. So I don't know whether they believed me or not. Um, and this was with the name Humboldt Universität. You cannot think what happens if your university is called, I don't know, uh, Hochschule für Wirtschaft und Recht and you go to, uh, to whatever country and they, they don't believe you that such a university exists. And therefore, we joined the European Student Card at that time. And um, that me meant that all our cards here in Berlin got a hologram. And then later, all of our cards got a, QR, got a QR code and it could be validated that this university really exists, even if you don't heard of because you're, you're, a, a train, uh, you're selling train tickets somewhere in an obscure location in Hungary. Um, and then you can check whether the student is really a valid student and you uh, are uh, allowed to sell them a, a ticket. So this is, the, this is one side. And the other side is the service side. And this is the more complex side. Um, the problem is um, that you have um, a lot of services at your home university. And um, there are two types of services. One type of service, um, you are legally bound to be only, uh, you can only offer by legal reasons only to certain students, your own students. This is one of the biggest reasons we have in most universities the European Student Card integrated and this is a good, good time to ask a question. How many of you have a European Student Card integrated in your student IDs? Okay, this is awkward. Normally, this should be should be a lot more because um, it is you are not legally obliged to do it by the European Commission, but you are strongly advised to do it by 2025, and this is in two years. So um, let's just let's just say most of you, mo most universities, most higher education institutions will do this. Let let's assume, um, and. Um, the problem is you have a very nice card and a very nice or a, or a smartphone uh, system and you have a, a e-card and you have the uh, have everything every bell and bell and whistle. The problem is you have incoming students and um, you have services. For example, in Germany here in Berlin, if you are an incoming student, there are two types of students. You have on one side, you have the Erasmus students, the normal Erasmus students. They are treated as normal students. They get a normal campus card. Uh, from the university, 
and can use anything they like as a normal student. Um, but what happens if you're not in a Erasmus, a Erasmus or some time of, of longer term program? A longer term, longer term is in this, this case everything more than three months to a semester. So every, everyone coming for a shorter stay than three months doesn't get a card. Is not and not is not registered. So it is, the problem is with them, they will not be able to use our services. They will not be able to use um, the cheaper food in the in the canteens. They are not be able to use the cheap tickets um, on transport, and they are not be able to access uh, the library for mo uh, mo for. They are able to use the library, but only as a guest. So they're not equivalent to a normal student. And this, this would be the idea that if they present a European student card, compatible card from an external institution, they get these benefits. The problem is that these benefits are linked to either federal or, um, or other laws. So local or federal laws in Germany, and probably in also in other countries. Um, this is also a good question. Do you have similar problems at, with services at your, in your country? Please raise your hand if you do. Okay, in France, that I know of, yes. Okay, um, so this is mostly a, everywhere a problem because these laws partly were made 100 years ago. For example, in Germany, the Studentenwerk system, which operates at, to this day, or canteens, um, and also other things, uh, is bound by a law from the 1920s. Um, and this law is, is still in effect. This is still in effect, and um, this means that only students who pay the, uh, the fees and are registered students of a German university, of that German university where that Studentenwerk is located, can get the benefits. And this means that uh, we can build the best tech we can think of, but there will be no possibility um, until this law is uh, somewhat modified to uh, use the European student card in a meaningful way. Um, so this is um, just to see what, uh, just to tell you where this is, um, where this is going. And this problem is a political problem. So we, we are, it is not a tech problem, it's also an organization problem, it's a, it's a political problem, and this is a political problem in most European countries. So, um, what did we do in the in these projects? What we did is is focus on the tech side because we could not focus on the on the other side. We assume that some that if the European Union is serious about um, a European um, unified um, higher education area, that they will push their member states to to uh, change these laws um, sooner or later. So what we did is um, try to create in the EDSSIL-1 and especially in the EDSSIL-2 project some kind of, of tools to give the universities and to show the universities that, okay, guys, you can create an interconnected system in Europe so that um, you, can, you can integrate also foreign cards into your system, e-cards, and uh, students coming to you can use the services if the laws uh, allow this. So um, what we did is um, create some kind of, of toolkit so that universities who either have no ID, ID or paper IDs can go strictly uh, or straight to from those to an e-card system without having to have a smart card system. It's also if, if universities have a smart card system have some kind of of help to get an e-card system and then if they have an e-card system create some kind of interconnection in Europe and so to say the big vision was and still is to create something akin to Edurome for student IDs that we have a, a common ground and a common system which is so much interconnected and compatible that you can you are not you don't have to even give Erasmus students or program students incoming program students um, a card either a physical or an e-card, but they can use their card from their home institution to a full degree at your institution. The problem is what we faced uh, in, this, um, and in this project, and also Licia talked this about, we have a, in Europe a very, very diverse situation. And not only on the um, ID side, but also in this case. We have countries 
where you have a very highly um, developed system um, and you can build upon that. You have countries where you have almost nothing, so paper IDs at best, or some kind of plastic piece of plastic with, print, with data printed on it but without a chip. Then, on the, from the other aspect, we have countries where every university can do what they wish as, soon as, the, uh, as long as the funds are enough, but they have the, the full right to, to integrate their systems to their wishes. This is like Germany. Most of the time in, in Germany, universities have, have full control over their campus management and car management system, and there is no national agency or ministry or whatever who says what they have to do in this, this regard. In other countries, um, on the other extreme, you have countries, for example, like Croatia and Hungary, where there is a national um, um, strategy for student IDs and the national either ministry or some kind of agency who issues these, uh, um, these cards or these IDs. And um, if they say this, um, this is a paper ID, it's a paper ID. If they say there's a card, it's a card. And if they say it's an e-card, it's an e-card. And the universities have almost no say in this thing. They get fed with, with the cards or the, with the IDs uh, without their consent and, and everything between. So do you have any, everything between some, some governmental uh, uh, interdiction or nothing at all and, and, uh, or full interdiction? And to find a common ground in a, such a diverse environment um, was a big challenge. And also to get more information as from the previous projects, we had uh, some information from about some countries where universities were included in, this project, in these projects and, and told us unofficially um, what the situation in that country is. But for example, um, we had no knowledge about countries who were not included in these projects. So what we did is, um, so that we talked about, so what we did is to get um, information we made in this project, in the EDSIL2, um, a survey in Europe and sent it out to uh, a lot of universities and with great help from EUF because they have a lot more in their network as we do. Um, it went to over 60 universities in Europe um, and we got um, a lot of answers and a lot of knowledge about this current situation in, in, in European countries. Unfortunately, we still have a, a lot of, um, of white uh, blobs uh, on our map. We have countries, for example, Finland, where we have absolutely no idea what the situation is because we have no contacts in Finland. There, is, there are no answers from Finland. Um, but also, for example, from countries like Romania, Bulgaria, Malta, uh, we have absolutely no information what, what the current situation in car systems is. So if you are from one of these countries, please raise your hand. I'm really, really curious about the situation in these countries. Is someone from these four countries here in the room? Um, is someone from, from one of the Baltic states in the room? That would be also very interesting. Great, great. Can we have a short chat in the, in the uh, break, coffee break, about the situation in your country? Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, as for the other countries, um, we know mostly of the situation. So um, also thank you if you uh, filled out our questionnaire. I would like to thank you again. Uh, it uh, made our lives much, much easier, and we have now a knowledge, great knowledge about those countries and the situation there. So, um, after we got the requirements, um, we started our work and created four big topics. We have seen that, like I said, we have everything from there is nothing in that country, or, or paper IDs, that's almost nothing, um, to uh, fully featured e-cards, or, or they are going to the e-card world with, with big steps uh, without any out, uh, outside intervention or, or help, and, um, and they are the tech leaders in Europe. So um, what we did is create this toolbox, and this consists of four parts. One, uh, you need a card management system, so we provided in this project our self-built card management system from here in Berlin, um, which was modified according to the needs of the universities and is openly available for any public institution in Europe. Then we created um, an app 
This is also created as a fork of our Campus Card app, which we are developing here in Berlin. If you were here yesterday, I introduced you to the details of our Campus Card app and how it works and what we do with it. Um, long story short, it's uh, um, the next step in evolution of smart cards for us. We built it from scratch ourselves, so completely um, self-developed um, here in Berlin for the University Alliance. Um, it is a complete representation of the MyFair Desfire smart cards we are currently using and will be available um, um, shortly um, here in Berlin for the 10 universities. Um, also, um, we provided uh, for the service side that if you have, for example, libraries still using barcodes or or any other um, service where you need an NFC reader for to the, that you can use the, the um, smartphone with them, we provided um, the consortium partners and also the uh, also interested uh, public institutions with an NFC reader, which is a programmable reader um, from the company of company Elatec. Um, this is the Elatec TPN4 reader. It's an USB NFC uh, reader, which is intelligent and can be programmed according to the needs, um, and also the documentation for it and how to use this reader. Um, and also, um, the next step is the integration of EIDAS in this whole system um, that you can use the EIDAS authentication um, with your e-cards. And to prove this point, uh, with great help from the University of Normandy, um, where one of uh, our colleagues, Emily, is sitting here in the audience back there, um, they were adapting then this whole thing and, and proving that this uh, tech demonstrator we, we provided is really working in the, in the real world and adapted um, a feature set to the, from the physical card to this e-card world and sh have shown that what we built is not a pile of rubbish, but it works. So um, I talked about this one. We um, made a lot of interviews and, and questionnaires and to find out what's the situation and how diverse the situation is. And like I said, it's very diverse um, on the card side. What is very much uh, homogenous if you look at the technologies, and this is very fortunate, as um, when we started the project, we wanted, we had the um, goal to integrate some kind of integrate some kind of emulation um, of different technologies that you can use your card at different institutions, which is not possible with a physical card, but it is possible with a smartphone, as a smartphone can emulate different card types. Fortunately, this was uh, not necessary, um, as about 80% of institutions um, use uh, MyFair Desfire cards. So the MyFair Desfire is a de facto standard in Europe. Um, some institutions still use MyFair Classic and MyFair Classic is, is so old and so deprecated that we uh, said, okay, we really don't want to create an emulation for something which is very, very, very unsecure. It's, so to, to show how unsecure it is, um, 10 years ago, it was cracked. So you can clone um, a MyFair Classic card with a smartphone, um, and you could do this 10 years ago. So this thing is, is absolutely garbage. So if you still use MyFair Classic, I would I advise you to very much uh, go to MyFair Desfire or something else, because uh, you really can have a very, very bad day if you use Classic cards. Um, then we offered uh, or they created this app this is, like I said, based on our um, soon-to-be production version of the Berlin Campus Card app. And as you can see, it not only looks cool, it integrates the European Student Card, because one of the features, uh, or one of the things we noticed is that the integration of a European Student Card, as, as cool as it sounds, is not so straightforward as you may think. Um, the main problem is that um, the hologram is, is not, a, not, not a big deal. You buy the holograms, you let them hot stamped into your cards, and that's that. The big problem is the QR code. Um, the QR code is individual for each student, so for each card. So have, you have to print the QR codes when you print the cards. And it makes either um, a lot of effort, because you have to uh, modify your uh, layout to include a QR code which is large enough to be scanned to be able to be scanned 
or you have to print it on the other side of the card, which is probably empty or mostly empty, and you have to print the cards two-sided. It costs a lot of money and time. So for us, for example, it was almost impossible to include this QR code on our physical cards. Um, and that's what, that was the main uh, driver be behind uh, creating some kind of app. And this led to this um, decision to create a full-fledged campus card app and integrate uh, the European student card into the app. So this includes the European student card. It works. Um, you can you can download it and use it. Um, you have to modify it, of course, for your needs, but um, it is available. Then we have the open source uh, NFC system. You can see the uh, little icon of the NFC reader in the uh, top right corner. Um, the NFC reader, so up there, it's how it looks uh, if you take it off of this uh, nice gray uh, stylish case. You can integrate this NFC reader anywhere you like. So for example, in, we have them in card, card printers, in book lending machines and everywhere else as, a, um, as only the, the card itself, so only the, the board uh, um, and everywhere else where you have to put it in, on, a, on a desk or something like that. You can use the, the, the very stylish case, a gray case, and use it as a, as a normal device. And then we have the standardized e-card management solutions I talked about. This is a card management solution um, which was developed um, here in Berlin at the Campus Card Service Center um, for our needs um, as we wanted to have something uh, which is very um, modifiable but also uh, does not need a lot of resources. Um, and this is a card management system uh, which does all that and more. Um, it is... Um, so this version is a modified version of that, what you find here in Berlin running also currently. So if you go into main, to our main library, you will see the machines where, you, where the students get their cards issued. And behind all this, um, the, the magic is, is the card management system. Um, and this card management system also has one very cool feature that you can actually uh, connect this to anything you like, as long as the other side is an SQL database because it can, it has an ETL interface, an uh, enterprise transformation layer interface, which if you are not a techie, um, it is like a, um, a pick and place machine. It, it can pick um, predetermined things from your other database, transform it and standardize it for, for the card management system, that the card management system understands any database you like and on the card management side, it, it gets a standardized uh, data flow from that system. And this was necessary for here for Berlin because we have 10 universities and unfortunately we have six different campus management systems. So um, that's, that's from my side. Do you have any questions? It's open source, in a, it's in a GitLab. Um, you can either send me an email, so you can find it probably with Google, but it's easier to send me an email um, and I can send you the link to the, to the GitLab. It's not yet on the Oshua, so it will be on the Oshua, so on, on the Open Source University, uh, open source university Alliance um, shortly, but currently it's on the GitLab of the Humboldt Universität, um, but in a... In a uh, in a project which is completely open. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Another question from here. Did I Yes. Um, so what I see is that the just for the benefit of the others, because we heard the question. The question is any issues of regulatory aspects to implement. So the technology is here, but do you have any do you share any experience implementing this and facing any regulatory hurdles? 
So um, I see it that way that um, on one side we have a lot of push from the European Commission and also the German government has a lot of push. Um, I have talked, when what is it? It was before COVID, um, in 2019 with, uh, with the head of unit of the BMBF, so the German Ministry for uh, Higher Education and Technology. And I've talked to him about this. This was a meeting in Bonn with the DAD and, and there was a guy from there, the head of unit who is responsible for the higher education and for the European uh, connections. And um, unfortunately, uh, it went nowhere. So he said, oh, yeah, yeah, well, I will take care about it. Of course, this is very important. This is on high on my agenda. Yeah. And, and yeah, it was very high on the agenda. Probably when he went out of the door and something came even higher. And that, that was that. Um, what I, I see is that from the European Union, there is a lot of push. Um, the problem is that, like you said, in, in Germany, we have the very particular case that we have on one side, for example, Trudentenberg uh, laws are, is it, this is a federal law. That means that the federal, the BMBF, could, it's a federal ministry for higher education, could issue uh, a proposal in the, in the Bundestag, in the German parliament, to modify this law to, to be able to provide uh, some kind of um, so solution for that, how, how this all may look that they have to decide because there is, there is a financial component to that and this is the main reason that nobody has touched this because the problem is that you have a, if you go to the canteen, we were uh, with those people who were yesterday here, we were in the canteen and you have seen the prices, we pay the guest price and the student price is approximately 40% of that and somebody has to pay this difference. So the student price is below the, the, the real, how does it call it, the, but the market price. The, the, not, not only the market price, but the, the, the price, the student Studentenberg, uh, it costs for the Studentenberg to make this meal. That, uh, it is that, that way that the uh, three prices, so they, the, the employee price is, on the, is, is with zero profit. The, stu, uh, student, the student price is, is, uh, is with loss and the gas price is a profit, and it, it, is co uh, it is especially made that way that the guests pay for the students, and also the students have to pay some kind of pre-financing um, early, and also some is co coming from the, from the Bundesland, from the federal state. And that, that's the problem, that this is a, it is an exorbitantly complex system, and I, I'm pretty sure that it is very low on the agenda of politicians to, to, to to put it that way, it is a, you, as a politician, it's not a low-hanging low fruit. It's not something you can um, have water or catch waters with. It's like, yeah, we really don't want to take this on because it's, it's not popular. It's, it's not, it is a lot of work and, and it is only a fringe group who profits them, fringe group, so for them. So I'm, I'm pretty sure if, it, if it's gonna happen, it has to be happened from a European Union and probably uh, they have to, to push Germany to, to change this and also all other countries. Yeah, it's not, is it working? Yeah. Okay, uh, but the European Union says it's not competent to take those decisions. And no, no, but they have to, they have to somehow push the, the member states. So that is not their competency, but they have to, to tell, okay, guys, something has to be done that is, is usable. But like I said, I'm not a politician. I'm also not a lobbyist in Brussels. I am also an, only a, a tech guy uh, on, the, on the beating out of the stick. So um, I'm, I really cannot, cannot tell them what they have to have to do or uh, I only ca can tell them what we would like to have but in the interest of everyone um, I would like to uh, ask you that uh, we carry on with the next presentation because we are running out of time um, you can um, find me all day here um, in the breaks and you can also send me an email we can talk on zoom or or if you come to Berlin uh, anytime so um, thank you very much. Thank you, Tamás. Again, we have a, a tight schedule, but uh, by all means, let's use the coffee break and the lunch breaks to brainstorm and, you know, raise concerns. Stefan, 
um, will uh, now give us a sense of the e-signature, how we can make signing easier, faster, and more secure, most importantly. Thanks. So, hello everyone. It's uh, great to be here with you this uh, beautiful day in this beautiful chapel. And uh, as you just heard, the uh, sooner is going to be a coffee break, but you've been sitting for some time now, so just so I'm going to ask two questions as an excuse to get you to stand up so you make through the last part of this. So, can all of those that you were here yesterday on the training for e-signature, can you stand up please? Okay, perfect, perfect. Shake it a little if you want to. <laughs> Thank you, you can sit down. And those of you who are here new today or were not at the e-signature training, can you please stand up? Okay, a few, a few, great. Thank you. Hopefully you have some, uh, some oxygen and blood running around now so you can last uh, the last part of this uh, panel. So my name is Stefan Lidström. I work for the Swedish Research Council and uh, the SUNET, the Swedish University Network. Um, I, I work with the e-signatures at SUNET and also the, some of the large-scale pilots for the European Digital Wallet that we will look a little into later today. But uh, I'm primarily here in the role of Activity 2 leader for the CEF uh, building blocks and uh, e-services. So that's what I'm going to talk a little about today. Um, so I'll, I'll do, not do the long uh, talk today because, uh, as I said, there's soon a coffee break. But feel free to catch me later uh, if you have any questions. Anyway, the, the CEF building blocks and e-services activity that we had in the EDSSI project, we looked into uh, the e-translation CEF building block, the e-signature CEF building block. We also looked into student housing platforms, sort of building an application for that, and uh, the e-archiving building block. So basically, the way I see EDSSI, it's about looking into the future and see what is it that we need? What is it that we can do? But it's also a lot about looking into the knowledge we have gained in the past. So what can we build on that has already been done to enable what we feel that we need to do and have? So that's why we're looking into the self-building blocks, because they are already uh, thought through and also developed parts to see how can we create uh, the functionality that we need to connect all the different parts in this massive digital ecosystem that we're building, and particularly when we're talking about mobility. Because as we mentioned earlier today, there's a lot of diversity in Europe. How things are handled, how data is structured, how processes and culture is sort of evolving, manifesting, and, and uh, defining how we do things. Uh, and all the, e e e the, all the self building blocks, they're sort of built on two parts. One is the, the specification of what it's actually part, and one is the actual reference implementation, you could say, to, to make it easier to use. So, one of the, the building blocks we looked into, as I mentioned, was the e-translation. And uh, all the things that I go through today will be part of our final reports and deliverables. So this is just a small, tiny bit that you will get here of all the massive knowledge and information we've gathered. So I recommend reading those when they are released. The e-translations have two parts that we tested. One is sort of the manual interface, where you just sort of you can cut and paste information, you can put it into a web interface, and then you get the translated information in the language that you need and want. It also has an application programming interface, so basically that means that you can have computers talk to each other, 
And this is what I would say would be most interesting in, in uh, this context, where we, as, as mentioned in the beginning, how can we take all the information that we have in the different parts of Europe, in the different parts of the Erasmus projects and program, and translate them so that it makes it easy when we do something in one country, it should be understandable in another country, in another language. Uh, the, the second building block we'll look into, which is uh, slightly closer to my heart, because that's what I'm, I'm working with a lot, is the e-signatures. So basically here we looked at what, what, how can we use e-signatures to make it more easy and more secure to uh, handle the information and, and the agreements that we do. Uh, so in Sunet we, we have a, a service called EduSign, which is in itself built on the specification of the Ceph building block for e-signature. So we had this, and we looked into how can we utilize this in the Rasmus project. Uh, one of the things that we looked that was um, very obvious for us is the, the online learning agreements. So basically, today, most of, the, most of them are signed with simple e-signatures, which is part of the classifications in the EIDAS uh, regulation, where you have simple, you have advanced, and you have qualified signatures, e-signatures. So we looked into that, and this was sort of how can we integrate an existing service in the Erasmus Well Paper Network into something else, like the e-signatures, and enhance the current system that we have. So the second, second thing we looked into was the, the housing contracts. Also, as mentioned, this, this is something that most, if not all, students is in need of when they travel to other countries. They need to live somewhere. So we looked in the, from this point of view, how can we make something completely new uh, and from that point of view, make that as a reference for other third-party service providers. If there's someone else out there, either sitting here or somewhere else in, in, in Europe, that wants to integrate their system towards the Erasmus Without Paper uh, network that we have today, also including signatures, how would that be done? So that's, that's part of the housing contracts that we looked into. And you can then say, why, why do we actually uh, need and, and want to have other signatures than we have today. We have the simple ones today. Uh, do we need something else? So maybe not if there is trust, because that's usually the way I see it. The reason we use e-signatures is we, need, we, we want the trust. And if we already know each other, that's usually not a problem. But in this ecosystem that we're working now, there are a lot of agreements between people that have never met and probably will never meet either. So how can we create trust in those situations? So that's why if you go to from simple to advanced e-signatures, there are four parts that are important. One is authenticity. Is the signature uniquely linked to the signatory? We have identity. Can we be absolutely sure we can identify the signatory? Authentication, can we be 100% confident that the signature is created under the sole control of the signatory? And the last part, integrity. Can we detect any changes in the document after it's signed? So basically the power here is to, to look at, we have to the left, you see the OLA, the online learning agreement. It has the simple signatures. This is also signed with EduSign, which brings this to an advanced signature. And, and here you just see the picture. What's actually important and interesting is the cryptographic information that is attached to the digital document that you can validate after, afterwards. So what we also did, the, the second part of, of the project was looking, can we bring this even further? Can we take this from an advanced signature to a qualified signature? And uh, due to time, I'll, I'm not going to go into super details about that, but we, we reach the stage now where we can have uh, signatures, we can sign the, the OLA with uh, signatures based on qualified certificates, which is almost the same as qualified signatures, but we're, we're very close to do that as well. 
Um, again, so this is, this is basically what we did in the e-signature task. And the last part is the e-archiving ER, e building block. Here we looked at how, what is actually already done and how can we integrate that into uh, Erasmus with our paper. And we set up the Ceph e-archiving software. We tested it, we ensured that it worked, it fulfilled the requirements that we had. Uh, it keeps the integrity over long-term storage and uh, the automation and integration works as we expected. And with this, we also showed the flow of information. So everything from creating, for example, an OLA uh, with the information needed, we can sign it with the, the, the participants that are need signing that helps with the validation afterwards. And in the final stage of this information's life, cycle, we can archive it so that it will be available long time in the future to be accessed uh, if needed. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, you're extremely disciplined because you were able to keep us on time and on schedule. But for the audience, don't worry. There is going to be more of Stefan later on. So don't worry. And again, take advantage of the coffee break and then the lunch, light lunch break to brainstorm and ask questions, etc. Uh, we have, uh, uh, I want to thank all the panelists. This has been an impressive, an impressive um, panel and exchange. Uh, the success of speakers is given by people taking pictures of your slides. And I've seen a lot happening. And so don't worry, all this information is going to be made available to all the participants with all the links. I think that this is absolutely great when you see people starting taking pictures of the history back to 2014, et cetera. I'm not going to waste more time because I'm uh, uh, between you and coffee. And also because we would like to ask all the participants to get back to their seats. We have a connecting flight to Brussels starting at 12. We will have uh, policy officers from DG Connect starting at 12 via Zoom. So we would really like to ask you to be back fully caffeinated uh, at 12 sharp. Thank you. Welcome back. Um, thank you for um, coming back from the coffee break. Um, we have online, we are very pleased to have online two representatives of DG Connect. As we mentioned earlier, uh, the EDSSI L2 project is uh, funded by the European Commission through the Connecting Europe Facility Program. And so we're very pleased to have two representatives of DG Connect. We have Maya Madrid, a policy officer um, working in the unit responsible for e-government and trust. And then we have also Vicente Andreu Navarro, also from DigiConnect, also a policy officer who will be sharing with us his robust experience in security management and uh, data protection. So it's great that we are all here. And uh, I hope that uh, Maya Vicente, you can see the full, uh, the full room that we have here today, the full house. It's, a, uh, it's going very well. You cannot see me at all, but it's okay. You're not missing much. Um, and uh, it's, it's really great to have you because we are having a very interesting exchange between higher education institutions, service providers, um, international relations offices, etc. Et so it's really great to have you. Um, I think that we will start with Maya if uh, we, are, we go according to plan. And so Maya, I, I leave you the floor. And so you can guide us and introduce us to the concept behind the European digital identity wallet and um, also giving us a little bit of the policy landscape that is guiding um, initiatives like the EDSSIL2. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me first uh, share my screen and uh, you tell me if you're able to see it. Yeah, perfect. So first of all, thank you. Thank you very much for having me here today presenting a bit what the uh, what is uh, the European Identity Wallet and what is behind the proposal. So yeah, I'm Maya Madrid, I work in, in, the, in the European Commission, uh, Commission in Connect in the, in the e government and trust unit. And uh, we are the ones that are dealing with, with the IDAS, that is regulation, that, that the regulation that, um, that uh, let's say, deals with electronic identification and, and trust services. 
So uh, first of all, uh, let's go to the next slide. Yes. Uh, so let me talk about uh, a bit about what is the uh, let's say the 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 background and the fundamentals of the European digital identity. So uh, you probably might know the IDAS regulation. So the IDAS regulation, what it does is looks to enhance trust in electronic transactions in the internal market. And for that, it established common foundation for secure electronic trans 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 oh, sorry, transactions between citizens. So it relates what is now the regulation in two basic pillars. One is, the, of course, the electronic identification, and the other one is, is the trust services. So what happened on, on the on 2020 was that the European Council conclusions called uh, for the development of a EU wide framework for secure public electronic identification. And uh, this uh, secure public identification should include interoperable digital signatures uh, to provide people with control over their online identity and also uh, to provide control over the, the, their data. And it will also need to be uh, an identity framework that enable access to public and private services uh, cross border. So what happened after after this call for the council in the in, in the third of June of 2021? The Commission adopted the proposal for amending the IDAS regulation that it's now still um, uh, valid. That is the regulation of 2014. But the proposal, what does it is, is that it established a framework for a European digital identity. And you can see there in the in the slide that that. The proposal uh, is that this European digital identity is free to be used by all citizens as a way to identify users and also to provide certain personal attributes. And the purpose will be to access public and private digital services across the EU. It will also need to be accepted everywhere to, uh, to authenticate citizens and also uh, it's secure and privacy oriented uh, with the objective of protecting also personal data. So the goal here is that uh, gives uh, full control to users uh, uh, to be able to choose what, what aspects of their identity they can, they, they would, they, they can share. So this is an ambitious, very ambitious proposal from the beginning, and uh, it makes improvements uh, to what was, the, well, to what is the previous EIDAS regulation. Um, because first, it obliged member states to provide electronic identification to the citizens. It's an obligation for member states, but just uh, to be clear, it's not an obligation for citizens to use it. <laughs> so also that these electronic identifications um, will be mutually recognized across Europe uh, because. Uh, wallets are, 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 are thought to be developed in a harmonized way. And, and also on the main, the, the, the central idea for the European digital identity is that, is that uh, it, it's in full control uh, of the user. Uh, so let me now talk a bit on, on, on what is the, the central pillar of, of the, because I mean, the, the, the idea of the European identity framework, it's, um, it covers all the ecosystem, but the, the basic pillar is the, is the personal wallet. So the European digital uh, wallet are, are personal wallets that would allow citizens to first uh, digitally identify themselves in public or private service private services. This is the, it covers, let's say, what was covered already by the, the first EIDA regulation, not with through a wallet, but, but in fact the IDAS notes that you know very well, but will also allow to store and manage the uh, identity data and uh, documents in electronic formats. So when we are talking about uh, identity data that it's not uh, directly linked to identification of, 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 of the citizens. We are talking about uh, documents like driving license, medical prescriptions, or education qualifications. So what happens in, will, will happen with the wallet is that this credential um, can be linked to the user identity. So with the wallet, uh, citizens will be able to provide their identity where necessary, but also to share this, this kind of documents that we are talking about. 
Uh, we'll also like to remark that the European digital identity wallet will be built on national systems. So um, it's not that we are, let's say, developing a new um, European level identification system. So they will be based on, on, on what member states have already developed. Also, that wallets uh, will be issued by member states, uh, as I said previously, in a harmonized way, just for them to be interoperable. Uh, what you can see here is, is, is where the use case, where do we want wallets to, to be used? So, uh, for example, uh, well, first of all, is, is, is um, identification of of, of, of um, citizens, uh, for example, to, to open a bank account. Uh, when we are talking about sharing documents, uh, a citizen could use it to prove that they are possessed, uh, uh, that, that have in fact a driving license, but also to obtain a present medical prescriptions. These are use cases that are, let's say, very, very formal, but we were also thinking about other use cases that, that will be linked to present loyalty cards of, 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 uh, of your game or tickets or membership uh, cards. It will also allow to sign contracts, so that, that will partly be covered by, by, by my colleague Vicente, but in fact, it will be able, uh, with a citizen with a wallet, to sign um, uh, declarations or contracts. So what is, uh, what, what are the main, let's say, pillars for the development of the European digital identity? This has been quite a process, to be honest, because you know that the proposal was there on 2021, uh, but it's still under um, discussion uh, with the legislators. So um, since it was proposed, uh, we had, uh, the, 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 the pertinent discussions that we need to have with the Council, with the Parliament, where we are now in the process of the trialogues. If, if you're not very familiarized with how regulations are adopted, this is more or less the way you first discuss with Council, then with Parliament, when we fall together, and now we are in that third stage of, of, of discussing um, with, with the two legislators, and, and we hope that by the end of the year the, the, the legislation is adopted. But at the same time, uh, we have started together with the member states to develop um, the technical, let's say, requirements for what is the wallet. So, the same time the the the, the proposal for the Commission was adopted, it was also established um, a common toolbox that is uh, the the the. Um, that it's the, the, the forum where member states and commission have worked to, to develop the architectural reference uh, framework for the wallet. So together with member states, the commission has been discussing and adopting common standards and specification for the European identity wallet. This is still something that is uh, ongoing, but it's very, uh, it's, let's say it's, it's, it's uh, ongoing um, work but very, very very advanced to be uh, to be honest and also uh public if, if you would like to to access the documents uh, the, the, the the architectural reference framework agree it's not only the legislative process and the wallet technical specification but also um the large scale pilots so the large scale pilots are grants that are under the digital europe program. I know that your project was covered by the, the CEF program. Now we move to another one that is the Digital Europe program. So there were calls for large-scale pilots um, around use cases uh, of the e European identity wallet. The goal here is to test the wallet in different um, use cases, but also that these pilots will evolve in a real uh, use case when the when the uh, the pilots are over and also the, the, the regulation is adopted. And the fourth and last pillar here is the wallet reference implementation. So Commission has procured a reference implementation of the wallet, so it will be kind of the software of the wallet that can be used by the large-scale pilots to test, but also that follows the wallet technical specification developed in the tools. 
So just for you to give you an idea, we have the legal, the, the legal uh, path that we are following, that's still discussions uh, with Parliament and Commission, and then the technical side of the implementation of, of, of the European Identity Wallet that, that involves the, the, the development of the technical specification, the testing of the European Identity Wallet, and also the development of our reference implementation. Uh, so what, what have we achieved for the moment on, on the different strands? So the first trialog, I was talking to you before the trialog are, were uh, commission discussed together with the Parliament and with the Council was on the 21st of March. And we, ex we expect that the regulation is adopted by the end of this year. On the wallet technical specification, uh, we had the first um, release, the 9th of February, is the Architectural Reference Implementation ver version 1. Um, I'm sorry that this is not updated. We have a second one in April, uh, but this is a document that it's evolving. So there will be more versions of the Architectural Reference Implementations as member states keep working on, on the different aspects of the wallet. Um, technical specification also uh, with the input of the large scale pilot. The wallet reference implementation, we will have the first release very soon. It will not have all the, let's say, um, um, functionalities uh, in the first release, but then we will be having a second release by September and a, a third release by December also um, looking at what the architectural reference framework has developed and, and the input from the large scale pilots. And the large scale pilots that started officially the 1st of April and uh, that had two years to, to be developed. So let me talk about a bit more of, of the architectural reference framework. So the architectural reference framework is where uh, member states um, together with the Commission, are defining what are the elements, technical elements, and, uh, and that, that the wallet needs to have and how are they described. So the, architectural, uh, the architecture is a moving target. Also, not also because it's evolving to include more elements that were not in the first version, but also because the, the, the legislative process is still ongoing. So even though we are uh, developing the, the technical part in parallel with the legislative progress, in, in process in the end, what comes out of the legislative process needs to be reflected in the, in the technical side. So this will be, evolve, uh, evolve, will be evolving as, this, as the process is still ongoing. So uh, as I said before, the document is open. You can take a look at it uh, if you're interested. Uh, it's shared on, on GitHub. And, and uh, it's also there to collect feedback from, from stakeholders. Uh, and also new releases. So we had uh, the first and the second release, and I think that, we, so of course, we will be having new releases uh, depending, well, not depending, uh, when, when we update um, and adopt new, new functionalities uh, there. So just for you to understand a bit how is the architecture and how we think about the wallet uh, is going to look like. You see there that the user is in the center that will have uh, uh, his or her wallet. We will need to have a PID that is personal identification data providers. This, this PID will be the one that will allow uh, uh, citizens to identify towards public and public services. But we will need also to have uh, qualified electronic attestations of attributes. So this, this is kind of a fancy name that it's uh, there for the, for the European Identity Wallet. But in fact, what we are talking about is documents like education credentials or digital travel credentials, mobile driving license. So it, it's the, the identification documents that, that um, are linked also to the user. We will need to have in the ecosystem the wallet providers that in fact, uh, in the end will be member states. Member states, as I said before, will be the ones that are obliged to, to offer their citizens um, a wallet. And then the relying parties that will be receiving the information for accessing uh, private and public services. 
We have different, you see there that we have different bad data objects uh, that are linked to the regulation um, when we are talking about identification, but also at the stations, at the stations that just remember that they are the documents links to, 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 the, to the citizen. Um, so uh, uh, what, what the idea here is that identification purely of the citizen, it's not the same, uh, it's, it's different for, from the sharing of the different documents linked to, 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 the, to the user of the wallet. So now moving to the reference implementation. The reference implementation, in fact, is, is, is an example of application of the wallet uh, based on the architectural reference framework. So um, it will, the aim is to support interoperability and, and, uh, and also the implementation of the European uh, digital identity wallet, but also to support member states when they need to develop their own implementation of the European digital identity wallet. We will use it for that, but we, want, we also want large-scale pilots to use the reference implementation and to provide feedback, uh, let's say, for the development of, of, of all this technical side of, of what this European identity uh, wallet. So the scope is in this first release that I was talking before, is that now we, we, we have uh, in the reference implementation the functionality of authentication. By Q3, we will have identification and mobile driving license, and in subsequent releases, we, we are planning also to have another one for the end of the year, and we will have extending functionalities depending on the feedback from the pilots that started in April. So what we want to have in the end is an open source reference wallet applications, uh, application, sorry, uh, with libraries that is tested. It will be certified. There's also a certification process in place, and that can be ready to use by member states to implement the wallet. So now for the pilots, uh, there, last year it was an open call for pilots uh, that were evaluated and selected and. Uh, as explained before, they formally started in, in, in April. We have four large-scale pilots. You see there that there's a lot of investment in, in, in this pilot and, and, and uh, a lot of, uh, a huge number of countries that are participating in, in, in those. Let me, I mean, it's just here that, but you see a bit uh, the, the, the numbers of, 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 of the people that are involved now in testing the European uh, digital identity, but just for you to know more or less what are the, the, the use cases that we are piloting in the different consortia that, that are uh, working on that. We're working on a mobile driving license to store it and present a mobile driving license uh, to open a bank account with wallet. Uh, uh, so they can verify user's identity. Uh, SIM registration to provide uh, identity uh, uh, for, for a prepaid uh, and postpaid SIM card. E-signatures, because with the wallet, the, the user will be able to provide a, a secure digital signature when they are signing different documents. Of course, accessing government services, because uh, this is the part that already co covered by the first DIDAS and it will be covered of, uh, again with the wallet. We have a use case on e-prescription, so the wallet can be used uh, to identify the citizen, but also to share prescriptions with the different pharmacies cross-border. All these use cases, please uh, be aware that are also cross-border use cases. Uh, and uh, again, for payments, uh, you can store payment credentials in the wallet. For traveling, also to store and share uh, travel credentials. And uh, just to wrap up a bit, because I'm extending myself too much, and I think that it will be the most interesting part for you is to share uh, to to share and and store educational qualification or professional. Um, certifications. So we have all these use cases covered by the wallet. Uh, we have uh, pilots that will be well, that will last two years and uh, we really expect a lot from these pilots because uh, what we would really like is that the pilots will be finally 
a use cases in production uh, when the when the wallet reference implement when the, the we have the adoption of the of the regulation enforced and 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 then, um, member states are able to provide a wallet with different let's say functionalities that they could that, that they can really use so that's all from my side i think that i will pass the floor now to vicente thank you maya that thanks for this uh, glimpse into the future it's really exciting and it's really exciting to see that it's happening and you know it's a beginning of a process you're still sharing your screen so if you can I'm go sorry. back, if you can go back. and uh, um, you probably have not noticed but everybody has been taking pictures um, <laughs> which is a symptom of uh, interest and so thank you very much I, I see that uh, there are many interested faces and I'm sure that there are a lot of questions or comments I wonder if um, anyone in the audience can break the ice or wants to ask questions or has any comments. I think that this is really interesting to see that this is happening and it's happening on different angles. Of course, the audience here today is mostly interested into the educational um, implications and advantages that this wallet will bring. Um, but then again, I see so many interactions with all the other initiatives and Thank you, thank you, Maya. Um, we will be collecting feedback and inputs from, from the participants in any case. Um, so if there are no comments or questions, then I would like to move and ask Vicente to take the floor and, and guide us through the, the hot topic of e-signature, uh, which is then at the basis of the safety and, and reliability issues. Vicente, the floor is yours. Hello, good afternoon. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we can hear okay, and see uh, smoothly. Thank you. OK, uh, so uh, I am going to continue with uh, Maya's presentation of uh, digital, the new digital identity framework for the European Union. Um, my focus will be put on the electronic uh, signatures. Uh, first of all, I forgot to say, I'm a policy officer in uh, e-government and trust uh, unit in, in DG Connect, and we deal with basically with the digital. Now we are fully involved in the development on, of the new digital identity framework. Um, I am in charge of the electronic signatures building block. Uh, that's why I'm going to, to give you this uh, presentation with a particular focus on the international aspects of them. And when we, when we talk about the international aspects, we mean uh, application or impact of EIDAS or cooperation uh, on EIDAS out of the borders of the European Union uh, with, with uh, countries that are not uh, member states of the Union. Uh, my presentation will be very brief because uh, there is not much to say about uh, electronic signatures. It's not the main focus of the, of the new regulation. All, all the nice things about the, the wallet have already mentioned and explained by my colleague, Maya. So I will try to explain briefly how uh, electronic uh, signatures are affected by the new, the new framework. First of all, the European Council, in their conclusions that launched and that triggered the, the proposal for, for the new framework, asked for including interoperable digital signatures in, in, in the framework. That's why one of the functionalities of the wallet that the Maya has explained is uh, the electronic signatures. The European digital identities will allow users to create and use qualified electronic signatures and seals that will be accept, accepted all over Europe, all over the Union. Uh, this is one of the trust services. As you know, the, the EIDAS regulation is based on two fundamental pillars. That one of them is the digital identity. The other one are the trust services. And one of the trust services uh, is the electronic signatures, electronic signatures, seals, anti-stamp, and as and time stamps, uh, as you can see there. In the former, uh, or in the current EIDA regulation, there were three uh, trust services, electronic signatures, 
website, website authentication certificates for proving the, the authenticity of our website online, and uh, e-delivery, electronic registered delivery services. The new framework introduces four more um, trust services that are linked somehow to electronic signatures that are the electronic archives, the, the trust service called electronic archiving that guarantees the integrity of, of documents uh, throughout the uh, conservation period, the, the electronic ledgers that provide uh, authenticity, integrity, accuracy, and proof of the chronological order in, in which uh, entries in the ledger have been, have been uh, issued. Uh, a new trust uh, service that is the management of remote electronic signature and, and circulation devices in order to facilitate uh, the provision of services uh, for allowing remote uh, signatures and uh, establish uh, conditions for, for, for this, uh, for this uh, service. And finally, one, one, one uh, trust service that has already been mentioned by, by Maya during her intervention, that is the electronic attestation of attributes. The wallet will contain electronic attestation of attributes. This, this attribute must be issued by trust services providers. They are trust services also. So this is the, the, new, the new framework. Mm, and uh, there is not much more to say about uh, electronic uh, signature in, in EIDAS. The, uh, the, the, the new framework maintains most of what is applicable to electronic signatures from the previous EIDA regulation, but there is one change that uh, can affect uh, at least the, the, the can affect uh, international trade, international relationships. That is uh, the mutual recognition of qualified trust services. This uh, with third countries, countries outside of the union. Uh, mutual recognition of qualified trust services is possible under Article 14 of EIDAS in the current regulation. It's, it's established like that since it was adopted. But uh, this uh, mutual recognition established in this article has never been implemented till now. So it exists in the regulation. There exists the possibility of uh, mutual recognition of trust services in general or of electronic signatures, qualified electronic signatures in the regulation, but it has not uh, been implemented. So the proposal for the new framework modifies Article 14 in order to make this, this process more straightforward. The, the current process is based on, an international, based on an international establishment of an international agreement that is a very cumbersome procedure with participation uh, at different steps uh, by, by all European institutions, member states, parliament, the council, even the court of justice, if someone, uh, some of the parties think that uh, the, 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 their, their rights can be affected by the, the adoption of the international agreement. So it's a very cumbersome procedure. The new proposal tried to make this process a bit more straightforward, adding the possibility of uh, achieving this mutual recognition of electronic signatures and seals or qualified trust services in general via uh, implementing acts. That is a, a process that we expect that will be a bit more simple and will be, uh, will possibilitate the, the, the make possible that uh, we can adopt these decisions on mutual recognition of third countries electronic signatures more easily. But in the meanwhile, we are preparing for this uh, new framework and uh, the, the, the current situation is that even if only qualified electronic signatures have the, quali uh, the equivalent legal effect of a written signature in the EU, the regulation also says that legal effects of uh, electronic signatures cannot be denied in principle. They cannot be denied only on the grounds that they are in electronic form or that they are not qualified. So any kind of electronic signature at least must be or implicable should be accepted. What have we done in order to facilitate this uh, recognition of electronic signatures coming from third, third countries? We have uh, uh, tried to analyze if uh, signatures coming from third countries 
can be considered at least as advanced electronic signatures in, in the union. So um, we assess whether these electronic signatures are uniquely linked to the signature, see if they are capable of identifying the signature, as you have in the slide, if they are create, created by means that the signatory has uh, under his or her exclusive control with a high level of confidence, and, and if this uh, signature are linked to the data in a way that can uh, can uh, show that no changes have been have been done to the document after the document was signed. If all these conditions uh, can be accomplished by, by a signature coming for a, from a third country, we have put in production the tools needed for validating them as EU advanced electronic signatures that are not equivalent to uh, or don't, do not have the, the legal effects of unwritten electronic signatures, but cannot be denied legal effects either. So this is a first step towards mutual recognition of uh, electronic signatures coming from outside of the, of the union. How uh, has uh, this been implemented? This process was triggered uh, by the invasion of Ukraine and the need uh, by member states of validating Ukrainian electronic signatures in the, in the member states. We have created a set of tools that we call uh, the third countries, uh, others for advanced electronic signatures, list of the lists. It's a, it's a trusted list that facilitates compliance with the IDAS, uh, proving legal effects of electronic signatures that are not qualified. Uh, this not, does not impose new obligations to, to member states. It's, uh, we, we, we only have put in production these tools in order to facilitate the compliance with what, what or was already established in the, in the regulation in the, and, the, and the availability, and the availability of uh, uh, legal effects of any kind of electronic signatures and uh, has the value of formal checks that are performed by the Commission on, on the third country's electronic signatures. And uh, the effects of this are uh, that the validation of electronic signatures becomes easier, the, the added value of the assessment performed by the Commission of the, on the electronic signatures coming from abroad, and also, and the most important one uh, probably, is that the technical words for inclusion of third countries in this uh, third countries other local is uh, the technical words are exactly the same that uh, would be needed for for granting mutual recognition of qualified electronic signatures uh, but uh, we are missing the the legal requirements the international agreement or the implementing act with the new framework that is necessary for for granting this mutual recognition so uh, this is really a first step towards uh, mutual recognition. Uh, countries included in that list probably will easily, once the legal constraints are, are uh, uh, let's say, are, are, uh, we, we develop the, 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 the legal tools for, for, for um, mutual recognition, these countries will have uh, an easy pass from uh, this uh, verification of uh, their national electronic signatures advanced in Europe to qualified electronic signatures in Europe with exactly exactly the same legal effects than handwritten uh, signatures. And uh, that's, uh, that's all from my side, I think. Thank you very much again for inviting me to this uh, forum. And... Uh, I am at your disposal for any, any questions you may have. Thank you, Vicente and Maria. Thank you very, very much. This is, uh, again, really exciting. If I can uh, probably pinpoint to a couple of elements. Uh, there is a lot, of hap a lot happening with the digital wallet, the e-signature. Um, the key words here are trust, interoperability, we need to uh, still tinker with a little bit of uh, elements concerning administrative and regulatory hurdles that are always on the way uh, to modernize and digitize. But uh, it seems very clear that there is a policy commitment. Um, the good news is that the European Commission is putting money where their mouth is. And so we have seen with the grant, um, the grant 
uh, agreements being signed, the framework contract being signed, and also all the accompanying measures through the Digital Europe, Connecting Europe facility, as well as the Erasmus Plus program. So there is, a, the, there is a lot of traction, there is a lot of attention, and from us, from our perspective of end users and users, um, there is always the challenge of implementation. So thank you very much again for giving us um, a little bit of an idea and a concept of what is the policy vision, what is happening, and what is going to happen in the near future. Any comments or questions from the audience before we, uh, we let Maria and, uh, and uh, Vicente go? Of course, you're most welcome to stay as long as you can or want. Um, any comments, first reactions, please, Joachim. Hello. Hi, my name is uh, Joachim Wissling. I'm from the European University Foundation. Thanks a lot for the presentation uh, that you just did. I have a question. Since we are working on um, e-card in the context of the DSSI L2 project, my question was, um, could we also think in the future of storing the e-card of the students in the wallet that you're developing at the European level? And what would actually need to happen from the side of the universities or um, the providers of e-cards so that this actually can be implemented? Thank you very much. Thanks, Joachim. I don't know if uh, Vicente, you want to take that, or Maria? Maya. I think it's a question for Maya. I think it's for me. <laughs> Thank you very much. So yeah, for the moment, uh, what we are doing is piloting uh, use cases that, uh, uh, that, that already, or have already been selected among, among the ones that were proposed. But of course, we are not going to stay only in the use cases that are going to be uh, that, that are being piloted now for the wallet. But uh, but it's true that we still um, need to develop the mechanism to uh, to adopt new use cases for the wallet. So uh, we are to be I mean uh, fair. We are still in the very early stages on the development of the wallet. So uh, it, it will happen that we will have, uh, um, let's say, a rule book to see how we import new use cases in the wallet. But of course, um, stakeholders would need, uh, let's say, to, to, to define a use case that can be presented to, to, to however the governance is organized around this. So just to sum up, we only have, we are only working in a few use cases for the moment and piloting. But of course, new use cases will 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 be very valuable for the for the wallet, and we are working on how to include them. Thank you, Maya. Uh, and uh, apologies, I've been calling you Maria for a couple of times. So my apologies about that. <laughs> I, I'm very bad with names, but good with faces. We have another question from the audience. Thank you. Yes, my name is Lee Chan from the University of Music, Francis in Weimar. I have a follow-up question, actually. Could you, Maya, please uh, elaborate on the use cases in the higher education sector? Like, which, which use cases are these? Um, yes, and what, what is planned? Could you elaborate on that, please? Thank you. Could, could you hear the question? Okay, so no. let me translate again. <laughs> the question was, if you could give a, a concrete examples of the use cases pilot project in the area of education for the digital world, right? Yeah, in education, in education, what we have is a proposal to exchange, um, 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 sorry, education certifications through the wallet with issuers, mainly higher education issuers, to be honest, there are other participants that are not higher education, but mainly higher education institutions that will issue um, certificates to the wallet and the, the user will be able to share it with another higher or education institutions. This is, the, this is the, the project that we have. It's a project that it's based on the European blockchain service infrastructure as a following up, as a follow up of, of, of a project that already existed but without the European identity wallet. So now what they will be doing is, is continue piloting it but with the European identity wallet. This is the use case that have been presented to us and the one that is input selected. Thank you, Maya. Uh, any more comments, questions, or concerns? This is the right time to ask the questions you were always too shy to ask about 
digital wallet, the future, what the future holds, what are the implications for you as um, higher education institutions? Don't be shy. Here we go, another winner. A schedule. Yes. So a, a question from this side, what is the timeline that you see of uh, the wallet and the e-signature elements and features materializing and becoming more mainstream? Uh, maybe, maybe like I start with the wallet and and, um, and uh, we can take a complement with what will happen with the with the signature. So uh, we first need to uh, to follow the legislative process. So we have we hope to have the adoption of of the regulation by the end of the year. If this happens, the, the proposal is that um, in 12 months, the regulation is, uh, will, uh, sorry, not, not the regulation being enforced. So in 12 months, member states, the proposal is that member states will be obliged to issue a wallet to their citizens. So we are talking about the end of 2023. So then we will go to the end of 2024, of course, this is the proposal and it's still under discussion. So it, it might happen that this period of, uh, of, let's say, of grace for member states to issue the wallet is longer than 12 months. If it's not in the end, we will be seeing first wallets by uh, 2025. That's our hope. Uh, but this is the best, best uh, case scenario. <laughs> Thank you, Maya. So if everything goes well, by beginning of 2025, we will see digital wallets. I'm sorry, we can't hear you now. You're muted. Oops. Sorry, I was just summarizing. So if everything goes well and smooth and easy with the regulatory adoption process, then we can start seeing the first digital wallets as early as uh, first part of 2025. That's right. But Base all case scenario. On, on how, in fact, the... the uh, so, of course, the Commission proposal is a proposal and this is subject to change. So, if it changes, then it, it, it won't be the case. But that's the, that's the idea. Thank you. Thank what you again, Maya. Uh, any more questions, comments? If um, there is nothing more, then I would like to thank again Maya and Vicente for taking their precious time um, and for giving us an overview of what is happening and what is coming uh, towards us. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Feel free to stay connected. We have um, a few minutes to kill, so maybe I can ask uh, Stefan to give us also an operational perspective of what he has seen and, and what are the thinkering that we can do with technology to make his signature. Um, possible, feel free to stay connected and uh, feel free also to um, ask questions or comment um, on anything that you will see. Thanks. Okay, hello everyone again and uh, thank you Maya and Vicente for uh, presenting uh, your, your view on, on this and I think we talked earlier today about sort of the EDSSI looking into the future from, from the Rasmus perspective and what you see now is really sort of looking into the future, not just for Rasmus without papers, but in all of sort of uh, pan-European context and, and hopefully even further than that. And, and this is also a topic that is very dear to me. There's a lot of interesting uh, uh, aspects of this that I see and uh, work with as well. So. In the last few minutes of this session, I just wanted to sort of send some food for thought back to you guys. And uh, basically, looking at the EDSSI from a wallet perspective, and the overview is EIDs, DC4U, EWC, EWP. We love, we love our acronyms, right? So uh, I was gonna go through these a little shortly now just to sort of uh, give you some ideas of how this can actually, what, what this actually means. So, electronic identity, EID. Currently, uh, for example, in the Erasmus Without Paper dashboard, we use common for most services, username, password. 
Um, that's the sort of standard way of authenticating for many services. Going a little further, you have, uh, you come also in electronic identity, you can have a federated way of using identity. For example, we have Edugain in our sector community. We can use uh, My Academic ID to log in to our online learning uh, application, uh, agreement portals. So here you, you have both sort of Edugain access and you have EEDAS access. So this is where we're starting to interlink identities and, and use the, the power of the federated uh, systems that we have. So going, we, you heard Maya talk about the DC4EU, which stands for Digital Credentials for Europe. And this is where it's, I would say, it's most interesting for, for our sector and community, where, we, where we're actually going to pilot the educational use case. Uh, so there's, there's going to be a lot of work in regards to micro-credentials and uh, all the different uh, schemes that we're using in, in regards to education and uh, um, diplomas and, and such. Something else that might be interesting for, for, for this community to keep a little uh, lookout for is the EWC consortium, which is uh, uh, piloting, among other things, the organizational digital identity. So EWC stands for uh, European Identity Wallet Consortium, I, I believe, if I remember correct. So looking at that uh, organizational identity, this uh, can be very interesting in the sense that we're today in, in Erasmus Without Papers, we have the interinstitutional agreements. So how can we in a more better, easier, more trustful way sort of relate that we are representing an organization or that we are doing in something in kind of this organization so that we have uh, a good and clear overview of when a person is doing something and when an organization is doing something and when a person is doing something uh, representing an organization. So this will be really interesting, I think. And sort of putting all these together, we, we've been talking today about online learning agreements, both using the portal, using the dashboard, uh, the inter-institutional agreements. We've been talking about student cards. We've, we haven't sort of talked about micro-credentials, but that's also part of sort of the, the things that are coming up now. How can we represent the courses, the grades, all the things that Erasmus students actually do when, when, when they travel to other countries. And how can they, the students, get the uh, information, they, um, the processes they get through? How can they get this accredited and, and be able to share this in an, in an interoperable way? So this is, I think, the last slide that I wanted to sort of share with you in, in this session and what I would like to you or invite you to think about going home. What will actually be useful to put into this new parad paradigm? So on the left side of the picture, you see uh, how I usually depict the federated identity, where you have a user is talking to a service provider, could be logging to a web page, for example, the Erasmus dashboard. The service provider can check, or rather, this should be sort of an Edugain login. So the service provider then lookups uh, towards uh, redirects to the identity provider. The user inputs his uh, or her username and password in the identity provider, and the identity provider feedback to the service provider. So there's a direct connection here between the service provider and the identity provider. And the user is not necessarily always notified of the information that is sent here. So this is the idea to, in the self-sovereign identity uh, way of looking at this, which you, you could in, uh, map sort of on, on the digital identity wallet space. To the right, you have a user with a wallet. They can talk to a credential issuer. It could be an identity provider, or it could be a university getting their diplo diploma. Uh, the cr credential issuer can also sort of upload some kind of proof that the credential that is sent to the user is actually valid and is uh, issued by a university that someone trusts. And then it's up to the user here to decide how do I want to use this information? Who do I want to release it to? Who do I want to present it to? What parts of this information do I want to present? And then give that information to a verifier, which could be another university. 
that wants to check that the courses, the grades, all that is actually in line to enable this student, for example, to take the courses at that university. So the interesting thing here is that there's no longer a direct connection between the verifier and the credential issuer in the sense that there was a connection between the service provider and the identity provider. So some cases this will make sense to move things towards the wallet. Other scenarios maybe it doesn't make sense. For example, we're talking about the student card. I think it would be a perfect example when the, the student is issued a student card in the wallet and then it's up to the student to decide what to do with that. Uh, maybe uh, if you look at the OLAs, for example, it's more, it's more intricate in the sense that we have the student sign in. We usually have uh, an IRO maybe signing from one university and another university. So there could be more potential to have like a central system that actually maintains this information, regardless of the actual signatures could be done by wallets. So. This, there's, there's like a paradigm shift here in the sense that there's going to come a new things. Some things will probably stay parallel to the new paradigm, but the question will be what should move and what should stay for now? And what is the best way for, for us as a community to adopt all the things that will be coming? That's great food for thought. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and actually, talking about food, food for toad, and then food, food for belly, uh, we can uh, break for lunch. Uh, we have a light uh, sandwich lunch served in the other room. We will resume work at 2. Uh, but I would like, when we start again at 2, I would like to start with this slide. And thank you very much, because it's really an issue of, in this paradigm shift, that is happening. So this is happening. So, to, you know, we can resist as much as we want, but it's going to happen. So then it's an issue of uh, empowering the IROs, the higher education institutions, and then the students to make the best use possible of this system. And it's very good to have options moving forward and then deciding uh, what is the most suitable solution for our specific cases. So thank you very much for your patience. Uh, gate one, two o'clock, boarding, and then we go for another journey with private sector service providers. Thank you, enjoy your lunch, and enjoy the food for thought from Stefan. Thank you, welcome back, and now we have to fight the worst enemy in conferences, the after lunch. So you had your coffee, thank you, thank you to the technical support. Is this working? Yes, thank you very much. Very kind. Uh, so nothing better than the after lunch session than inviting, no, that's not us. Then uh, um, getting a sense of what is happening in the private sector. Um, what is happening uh, with the service providers out there and how do they react? how do they act, and uh, what is at stake for them, and how we can interact with them, and how we can attract them into our own little universe here, with the ESC, the e-identifier, the EID, whatever, and uh, where is Stefan with all his beautiful acronyms? Uh, he's probably somewhere recovering from all the acronyms. Ah, here he is. Um, so I would like to invite um, our panelist, um, Henry, Alexander and Jérôme. Here we go. Yeah, or you can sit there and uh, yeah. We want you everywhere. So um, we will now go um, straight into looking at how the e-card system um, can allow the interoperability with service providers. Uh, we have representatives of the private sector. I would like to leave Jérôme speak uh, at the very beginning from NTT data um, to give us a sense of what is happening. Yeah? You said you preferred this one, right? Yeah, can I have this one? This yeah. One? Almost, yes. Much better, otherwise I feel Working. Um, 
now he has to introduce himself as the IT manager. Yeah, this is awesome. Does it, does it work now? Uh, yeah, I think uh, it works. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> There's no uh, after lunch session without after lunch technical, right? That's, uh, that's, how <laughs> that's how we start. Does it work? No, yes, no, yes, no. If it stops, you wave, huh? We, we go through this game. It keeps you sharp. That's the whole plan, to stay sharp after lunch. Okay, let's try this. Um, I'm moving to the slide here. Because I would like to clarify in the first place that I'm actually not a service provider. <laughs> and we're also not dealing so much with what is the current of the service provider. Yeah. We will use this one, huh? I think this is, uh, this is the solution. I wanted to test you all, huh? Uh, no, so not so much a service provider. Um, I'm actually here presenting the, the European student card um, on behalf of the European Commission. So we, Entity Data, were implementing this European student card initiative part. Uh, you've heard a lot about what the European student card initiative is in the morning already with some history and so on. Um, so we thought it would, be, it would be nice to also provide you with a bit of context on what we have been up to um, in the European student card and, and most notably what the future holds. Huh? So my name is, uh, is Jeroen van Lent. I'm a, I'm a technical project manager at, at Entity Data. I will try to keep this presentation not so technical for everyone in the room to understand, but feel free to hunt me down afterwards. I will stick around for, for the difficult questions um, in case you would like to, uh, to ask these. So the plan for today is to sort of provide you with a bit of a historic and policy perspective. There was already a lot of things shared in the morning, so I think we can keep it brief in this regard. Um, introduce you sort of the benefits of the European student card. Why are we doing this? Why, why is all of this stuff happening, right? Uh, present the journey until today because we're building on, uh, on the work of other people, part of the stuff that you've heard about this morning already um, in the EDSSI and the projects that came before it. And then sort of highlight on what's ahead, but also how we, how we intend to build on all the great work that's been carried out within this project. Uh, because I think there's no bigger shame than to leave things on the table and, <laughs> and to start over uh, from scratch, right? So looking a bit into the, into the historical perspective, um, all of this sort of started around 2012, 2013, as you already heard uh, in the morning as well. For us, it was relevant that there was first an MOU between a couple of countries some people present in the room here that, that kicked all of this off, to sort of start the talks around the, um, around the European student card and introducing this, uh, this for everyone. Um, there was this pilot project, which ran sort of in parallel with the Erasmus Art paper, the online learning agreement, all the stuff that you've heard about in the morning, were um, led by, by CNUS in France, um, a pilot was carried out regarding the European student card. So this is where sort of the first principles were built around the hologram, a QR code, some details that I will, will get into later. Um, and then as of 2021, we have had the privilege to work on this. Uh, ah, someone was passing in front of the projector. Huh? <laughs> Uh, we had the privilege to work on this project um, as a part of this larger framework contract that is implementing the European Student Card Initiative, um, to which there's also some continued work being carried out to all the other things that you have heard already earlier today, with, of course, the aim to have a full deployment by 2025. This is the magical year that we've heard a few times, uh, the European higher education. Um, so... This is, uh, this is what is important for us as well. Now, also to explain that we're not in a, in a vacuum, this whole European Student Card Initiative that we're working on is supposed to build upon all the work that's been carried out in this project that you heard a lot of things about already, <laughs> um, and also sort of incorporate the outcomes of what is happening within EDSSI L1, EDSSI L2. Not everything under the work that we are doing, there are, uh, there's another lot involved that is also carrying out a lot of the work. So this is a bit how that is supposed to work. All with the aim to make Erasmus more greener, make it more digital, more inclusive, the things that we, that we all know are important for our students to, to take into account, right? Um, now, the, the policy framework, I'm very happy that Joachim explained it in the morning, so I don't have to explain you anymore what, the, <laughs> what this is all about. But we're building, of course, on, on the same things that were established um, uh, back in these, uh, in these years. And this is very important because it gives this initiative the legitimacy that it needs. This is the push, and I cannot stress this enough, this is the push from European policymakers, from education ministers of your countries, that this stuff that we're working on today in the room is very important to, uh, to be achieved, right? 
Um, so let's have a little bit of a look at the state of play and what is the European student card? Why, why do we need these sorts of things, right? So when we talk about the European student card, we don't imagine that you go out there and you issue a new card for your students. We actually imagine this to be a dimension that you add to your existing cards um, to provide sort of this common identity for higher education students around Europe. So the important thing is there that we are trying to find ways for you to incorporate this in your national or local student cards and make this as seamless as possible so that people don't have to carry around three, four cards at the same time, right? Now, for students, the main benefit here is that, of course, they get access to on and off campus services, um, affirming their student status. But the main benefit is that they can do this across the Erasmus Plus countries. So the moment they go somewhere else, that this card is recognized and that it gives them the benefits that they are entitled to. Um, I heard your, your struggles in the Mensa yesterday. I was not there, but how great would it be if your European student card would have worked in, uh, in paying for lunch, right? Um, for card issuers, um, it's really the avoid to the, the need to avoid new student cards. So what we often hear is that this is not so much a problem when someone comes to, to a new city for six months, right? When we go on a traditional Erasmus, we go for six months somewhere, we can wait a week um, or two for, for that card to arrive. There is a problem, though, in, in the whole trend where more and more people go abroad in shorter amounts of time within the European universities. You may go abroad for a summer school somewhere. And in these cases, really issuing a new student card, it often comes too late before you're able to, to benefit, uh, benefit from it. So the advantage here would be that no new student card is necessary and we can validate the student status uh, based on the, the card that is already there. And then for service providers as well, to streamline sort of this way we, we accept cards and we know how to read and understand student cards that are presented to us. That we can go beyond just looking at it and judging like, ma, ah, this looks fair or this is something that I don't trust. And that we have a way of, of establishing that this is, a, this is a student in a reliable way that we know how to use. Now, how do we do all of this? The, the European student card as a concept is sort of based on, on four features that we um, uh, that we used to distinguish here, and they're all added to existing cards, as I mentioned. Um, participating institutions are, are sort of able to um, roll out all these different steps and, uh, and get there, but let me get into, into the details a little bit. So in the first place here, oh, there's also the, the ambulance joining. No, Is it, they don't come for us? Okay, good. <laughs> uh, in the first place, we have a European student card number that is added and, and generated for each of the student cards. The main reason we have a European student card number is that this allows us to easily create and destroy cards whenever it's necessary, and that we can shield the identity from the student, from service providers, and so on. So the only number that they will interact with is that number that is specifically linked to the European student card. We can use this to, to validate it, um, and this is supposed to really create this un unique number that is there per card. Now, this number is then turned into a QR code that we put on the card, um, which allows the service providers or the universities in, in other places in Europe to, to validate that European student card. So that QR code uh, contains a URL to a validation service and the uh, European student card number. And this is then used to validate that card. Uh, that page that you will be sent to will simply show a thumbs up or a thumbs down that this is a valid student card it has been issued by a given institution and valid until a given date. Um, and then we have the European Student Identifier that I'm sure we've heard a lot about already. Uh, it's one of those other acronyms that keeps passing, uh, which is the identifier that follows the student for, for a longer time throughout their career at the university or even beyond in certain cases uh, related to lifelong learning, right? Now, why have we added a European Student Card number? Well, there is already a number that we could use. It's primarily to make sure that we can create and destroy numbers on the go whenever someone would lose a card, whenever we need to block something, whenever something happens that, that we can predict, and to not have the ESI uh, necessary to change them. And lastly, we have a European student card hologram, which is a visual recognition that we add to the card uh, to make this recognizable as a European student card. So whenever the student goes somewhere, that others will see, hey, this is a European student card and I can read this um, in this way. Um, at the moment, the key milestones, uh, we have around 1.6 million registered cards. So these are cards that are activated in our central database that can be validated elsewhere around Europe based on the QR code. 
that are created by, uh, by around 212 card issuers. Uh, we call them card issuers because in certain cases it's not only higher education institutions, it may also be student unions or, or national entities that, uh, that provide this, right? Um, we have a lot more uh, card issues registered in the European student card router though that, um, that have shown interest to roll this out. And we have a lot more holograms requested as well. Um, this is because today it's, it's possible, it's perfectly possible to issue a European student card with just a hologram, which would signal that you are participating, that you would want you know, your students to be treated as, as locals when they go abroad. Um, but the, this, uh, these cards are not registered within the European student card router, so they cannot be validated, right? Um, and as you can see there, there's 15 countries um, around Europe that are, that are issuing cards at the moment. Now, uh, looking a little bit on, on what this is now, uh, we are part of the European Student Card Initiative, building on uh, the student service infrastructure that we have been discussing here. What does this mean, right? So for us, as a project team, we are we're working on various elements, trying to sort of cover all the sides of deploying this European Student Card, because it's not only about providing a technical solution. It's also about providing training opportunities for you around the room if you want to learn more. It's about providing communication, help desk, support, all these various different tasks that come with this rollout. Um, and our objective here is really to make this onboarding and for you to adopt the European Student Card as, as seamless as possible, right? Um, for that, within this year, we're primarily focused on sort of five streams of work that I think are, are relevant to present. Um, of course, we're looking into the, the governance uh, framework of all of this. Who do we need to consult whenever we move forward with certain decisions? Um, I know that many of you in the room are, are sort of part of this in, in certain ways, right? We have a couple of networks of universities involved. We have some networks of service providers involved. We need to make sure that this suits the needs of, of people and is also easy to implement for everyone involved. Now, of course, we're also doing the IT infrastructure, which I want to dive into like a little bit later uh, because we have some, some specific updates there, training and support, um, stakeholder engagements and, uh, and communication. And then we have a task which, which I really want to highlight. It's the innovative technologies and foresight, which in my book is the most exciting and most interesting one. And this is where you know, we can take some of the outcomes of the great work that's been done and, and take this to the next level. Because we realize that the European Student Card, as I presented it now, with the QR code um, and the European Student Card number, is, is really just the first version. This was the first concept that is rolled out, and we intend to continue to maintain and support. But we also want to look ahead and see, OK, what can we do with digital credentials? What can we do with the, EC, with the, EU, with the DC for EU, uh, the EU identity wallet, and all the stuff that you've heard about? How can we make sure that the European Student Card is compatible with all the technologies that, that are up and coming, and that in 10 years from now, we can all be a part of it, right? Um, specifically looking at, at what we've been doing today, though, we have been working hard to, to migrate the European Student Card Router. And for those technical people in the room, the European Student Card Router is not a router. It has nothing to do with, with routing. It's, it's a central database where we store these cards that is there to, to validate it, right? Um, what we have been doing is, is primarily moving this to the European Commission infrastructure and really making this a European tool. And with that, we have redesigned and implemented the, uh, the data model that's underneath to be compatible with other European in initiatives and so on. Um, and we have redesigned the user interface to feel, to feel more European. Um, what we're doing now is to deploy this on, on the Commission infrastructure, so on digit digit uh, data centers, which among all of us is, is a challenge sometimes. Huh? <laughs> Um, the plan is to launch this uh, as soon as we can, really, because we would like to you, for you to benefit from it as quickly as, as you can. Uh, but this will very certainly be, uh, be before the end of the year. So that's, uh, that's what we're looking at. Um, now, in terms of the sort of work that we've been doing and, and stuff that is carried out, we recognize a couple of levels of validation that I think are, are important to share with you um, in terms of how European student cards can be validated. As I mentioned, we have, we have the hologram in the first place, which is sort of the, the thing that can be used for showing our use cases. I, I go to a, to a museum, to a bar that provides me with a, a low value discount. It's enough to just look at the card and see there's a European student card logo there, right? The, the, the hologram. But for most use cases, we would want to do a little bit more, right? And move into a, a QR code validation 
where we can actually check that this card is still active and the student is still enrolled within, within the institution, which we can use for some more advanced use cases um, related to public transportation in certain cities um, or, or bookstores that would offer a, a higher degree of discounts, 50% off for, for students, for example. Um, we have a level two, which is a, an API validation as well, which means that higher education institutions can build other applications on top of this, of this logic that we have. So they can scan the QR code, assign a library balance to it, uh, have a, a, Mensa, a Mensa card linked to it, um, and then in the meantime, in the process, check with the, with the central database that this card is still valid, right? Now, there's also level four and five, uh, no, level three and four, <laughs> we started at zero, um, which work has been carried out in the past, this needs to be acknowledged, so there are a couple of ideas there on, on how this could work. Um, both are still being revisited by us at the moment, and we would also like to, to have your input to see, you know, what are the real use cases that we need this chip in the card for, what kind of offline validation do we need to do, uh, what are the most common use cases and how can we make sure that this is, this is interoperable. So for the moment in the, in the migrated version, this is only supported into, in a, into a very limited, uh, limited fashion. As I said though, I think, I think what's ahead is, is more important is that we are currently working on the, uh, on the first generation of, of European student cards, making sure that this all works while looking ahead into the, into the student card that can be used you know, five to 10 years from now, which is, which is probably more interesting. Uh, we're developing some standards there to, to make sure that we can have all of this in, in digital credentials. And of course, we're working closely with the EU identity wallet uh, initiatives as well to make sure that things, uh, things work there. Now, lastly, since, uh, since I heard uh, Tamás mentioning that there was uh, some lack of contact with some countries, I was surprised because we are actually in contact with all the countries that are, that are around. So thank you as well from my side for, for always being approachable. We carry out an annual ESC survey that will be launched again in, in this autumn, but I wanted to share with you some results from, from this year because we had uh, 5,700 people participating in the survey last year, and we do hope this year that there, will be, uh, that there will be even more or at least the same number of people that are eager to share their experiences, primarily to understand how you use student cards on your campus, what are the biggest needs with service providers that, that you see, and how can we make all of this better uh, along the way, right? Um, the governance structure is also ongoing, as I mentioned, where you, where you can see who is, who is involved and so on. But what I mainly wanted to highlight here is that we have a website available with all the information, which is a website for, for the whole initiative. So it's the European Student Card Initiative, all the work that's carried out within our lot focusing on the European Student Card, but also on the side of the Erasmus Without Paper and, uh, and the various other initiatives. Information is available there. So if you need a place to start looking, this is really the place. Um, and in the meantime, we will continue to also develop more materials. So we intend to publish more training materials, support you in rolling all of this out, and organize training sessions with, uh, with some of you as well to make sure that this can all be implemented as, as painlessly as, uh, as possible. Lastly though, if you face any questions, any problems, anything you would want to ask regarding our work on the European Student Card, you can send an email to esc.support.entitydata.com where we will be happy to, to answer your questions or engage in more specific discussions as well. That's it for me, so thank you very much. Thank you. This was absolutely brilliant because now we know a few things. First of all, there are benefits for the students, for the universities, and for the service providers. So it's a win-win-win. Um, second element, it's inevitable, it's gonna happen. It's happening, so, you know, like it or not. Um, and another very interesting element here is that this is a transparent, open process. We have an email address, we have a website, we have training materials. The concept here is that, uh, and then now I remember what uh, Lee Chan mentioned in her presentation, the difference between a, hard, a gentle push uh, versus, uh, I don't remember the exact expression that you used, but uh, forceful, uh, a more forceful approach. Um, in this case, what I would like to see also is the participation of you as the higher education institutions uh, into the survey, tapping into the wealth of knowledge and tools that you see here, um, uh, the, the QR code to go and access information, also to learn from other organizations that have done it in the past, uh, what works, what are the major challenges, but also what really, you know, we can learn from others 
who have been doing this. So thank you again for making very explicitly the case for the benefits involved into this process and also to the point that this is or now a process that is undergoing and will actually move forward uh, by 2025, which is tomorrow. Uh, ambitious goal, but you know, you need to be ambitious. So thank you very much again and feel free, don't feel shy and get in touch. Uh, make sure that you access all the uh, support system that is out there. Uh, Henry, uh, we will have a, an excellent presentation. I hope I'm not spoiling anything, but Henry will be presenting Cuario, which is more than just payment platform. Um, so, and we will look at how service providers can tap into this ecosystem and make everybody's life easier. Thanks. Thank you very much for the introduction. Hello to everyone. I have later 14 slides, so uh, maybe we're a bit faster than half an hour. So we have a lot of time for questions, uh, for discussions, and uh, I have a lot of business cards with me, so you, we can share it and have meetings afterwards. Before we start, just one slogan, and you have seen me on my shirt, so I'm from the company called uh, Picunder. We are part of a group of organizations, and uh, the last uh, change we made, you probably have seen, is that we acquired a company called uh, Coario, which was really the, the missing uh, point in our complete uh, portfolio. If you see the complete portfolio, we're doing nothing else than only payment. It sounds uh, very stum, and as we say in Dutch, uh, but uh, it's uh, very challenging. So in some countries where you are, you probably have seen some of our solutions, either in public transport, either in payment, or uh, also just as a fintech, because the mother company, she made us, we are developing fintech solutions. So if some of you have an ING bank account or are using in the Netherlands an OV chip card uh, stuff, then uh, you are somehow using us. But if you want to have more about it, we can dive later into them. We are, of course, international operated. You see on the logos uh, in which uh, countries and markets we are, and uh, feel free uh, to call also from other countries. We have a license, we come later to it, to make this business in over 30 uh, countries, even over the uh, ocean. So there's enough space for new things. And why we are here? We are here because we're making things different. I, we talked today about many things when it comes to payment, university service, etc. Um, every one of you probably knows uh, the typical closed loop uh, payment system. If I'm using now some words, closed loop, open loop, I, I think, uh, is it clear or do I have to define it? Open loop is everything we pay with our bank cards, credit cards, and so on, and closed loop where we pay for with, on educations or on companies with employee cards. And as Thomas mentioned uh, today, if you go here to the dinner, uh, you have to top up your card first and then you can use it. If you don't have a card, you not even get a drink anymore because they're not accepting cash anymore. We make it a bit different. So we coming since, or me and myself, we coming since over 20 years out of this closed loop business part. And we have taken the advantage that we're taking the good part of the closed loop stuff. So the rights, the user experience and everything with us. And we added everything to an open loop system. So the backend is complete banking compliance. Therefore, we can also make more than just uh, the payments in the educations. For example, in the project of Frankfurt, we also um, finance the complete student semester fee over this project. So the student has only one way to pay at the university. Today, we're diving more in, into Coario because Coario makes a lot of things different. With Coario, in the future, you have one app which is connected to your existing student card. So we can, go, we can come in and inst installations. We don't need to change cards. We can use applications on the card, but also we can go on U and UAD level. So you decide in which way we're integrating. With that app, you are able to pay every service at the university because the money in the app and the app itself is your own private money. So it's like your bank account at home. So you don't load any more a student card somewhere. You cannot use it only in Berlin. The wallet is following you. If you come to another university, if you go to Hamburg or wherever here in Germany or in Europe, you just can connect your card, your university card, and then you are able to pay in the university with the same amount. You can invite the students, the employees with the rights, so you can have different rights, different discounts and every different university. And this makes us unique uh, in the market so far. I guess there will be some other players coming. Uh, we also can integrate non-university environments. 
So if your campus is in cooperation with a gym or with a cinema or with a uh, bicycle uh, renting station, then we also can implement them because the financial clearing of that will be made by the bank. So the bank is taking care about the money. So you as a university, you are free because we're taking care about this business. So in the future, no one is uh, clearing the money anymore at the university. There's no one who has to um, be careful about the money when a student loads, leaving the university to pay out. Everything of that will be handled by us, like your normal bank account. So, as I said before, we also take care about your money. So we are complete uh, licensed uh, as, a, as a bank, so PCI and banking conform. We're using as a mother bank the KBC Bank in Belgium, so we're just a small uh, Belgian bank. Maybe you've heard about them, because we don't want to be in contact with the money of the students or of you, because otherwise it's in our balances, and that's uh, probably then a problem if the company has some not so well uh, outcomes. So therefore, it's complete banking conform. You can integrate it in all your services. We can offer an own app. We can offer an integration. So Tamash, for example, is developing a nice uh, university virtual app. We can integrate the wallet in that app, so you don't need to have an extra wallet, an extra app. We can also integrate a card. We're playing right now also with the game of Apple, so uh, that uh, on the phone, you use the phone himself as a payment method. So far, QR code, but we're working already on uh, with a cooperation with Apple or with some tricks with Apple to also use the NFC way. The outcome where we want to go is, sorry, that we want to offer this. So we want to be the payment method which you can be used at the campus completely uh, with integrated locker system, with integrated follow me print system. So everything what you have in the university environment. As I said before, in the project of Fra uh, Frankfurt, we even uh, pay uh, travels and uh, uh, other stuff for the students during his semester has to pay at the university. So if there's someone, uh, a professor who sells scripts, uh, scripts to the student, we can build it up with this system. Yeah. And as I said before, always with the app. And if you have people which I don't want an app, which I want to use still the card, they can just connect the card to the application. As mentioned before, the money flow of that, you see we have the user, we have QRO as a clearing platform in the middle, and we have the bank behind. And every one of us or of you will be a merchant, so like uh, you're ordering a terminal at your gas station or whatever. So uh, you can even make a bigger network, you can accept different others, you can allow an, an imbus or an, an, a snack bar uh, on the campus in the future to open, so it's not dependent anymore on a student network. We can integrate vending machines from several suppliers, we can implement uh, several cash register suppliers, so we're not dependent on any single uh, supplier because the money is handled centralized. Of course, we are connecting to a lot of stuff, and I make a lot of text form, and normally I am a fan of using more pictures and shorter presentations, but I thought uh, maybe this presentation will send around, and some of you want to read a little bit more about it. That's why uh, we put more input in it. We have a lot of APIs, so we can connect to several uh, environments. Um, we are happy when Jerome has this application ready that we can use uh, the identifier from it, because then we have one identifier at the app, we also have uh, talked about uh, hygiene and uh, My Academy, so we are welcome to also implement that so that the student don't have to use a login system of the university. He can probably log in just in the future with his eGain account and automatically he is onboarded. A student which is not onboarded, you can invite him. You can invite him by sending him just an email uh, where he can scan the QR code and automatically uh, when he comes at the location at the university we know he's a student, he gets his discounts. When he's leaving the university, we get normally the information by the card management system or by the IDM system so that the student is kicked out again, but he still can use his wallet, his money, and can pay as a guest uh, at, the, at the university. Okay. Some more features where we integrate. Of course, it's important to support vending machines, posts and tilts. One highlight is the print management stuff. We have a complete integrated follow me or that's not allowed anymore to say because now the brand is owned by someone. Uh, so we call it print management. So Kuari has a full implemented print management system. So a student can easy, or even the employee can upload his uh, print to our cloud. He goes to the multifunctionalist and can print. If one of you going to Switzerland from next month on, 
and uh, you have to print or scan, just download the app, go to the post office in Switzerland and you can use the environment there as well. So it's not only made for education, the system is made that uh, it's a really broad uh, system um, where you can integrate your services. I have no, not every implementation here now, so, but you're all welcome. We can discuss every single case. Uh, and I think in the history of uh, 25 years and also the 20 years of the INEPO where we bought Coario from, there are a lot of experience uh, in projects, how we solve things. We also can work with international currencies. So if you're leaving the European uh, 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 um, environment, we also can support students there. Also in Europe with different currencies, because the bank is doing like in your home bank, if you're with your, paying with your own credit card, they make a transfer for, for Europe. Yeah. And of course we have a vision, and the vision is this in short form. I think this uh, slide shows everything uh, uh, what I will speak about. And uh, with this application, we really have the solution for all to the Rasmus and every, and every other universities when students are leaving, when students are moving from A to B. And as I said, we are welcome everyone around Berlin in the city, every sport club, every hotel, every restaurant to support this payment method as well, because it helps us also there to get discounts for students, but also use it as one unique payment system, because it works the same way as if you are paying with, I think the most of you know PayPal a bit, and um, we're just using the nice way of PayPal in our own way, but we're adding all the good, good things of a closed loop system so that you have the rights, the management, the discounts, the APIs, everything what you not can do with an open loop payment system. And we will see what the future will bring. Today is a wallet, so you have to top up your wallet with your bank account. Maybe tomorrow we're just adding a credit card uh, behind it. So we have the technology in place already, but uh, we have to go step by step to not overrun uh, 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 things. You know, we are in Germany, we're, uh, and we are even in the capital of Germany, but you have seen, I guess, so often shops where not even a, a, a payment card is allowed. Uh, our mother company is from the Netherlands, there's the other way around, so there we're not allowed to use cash, so everyone asks us for the PIN code. So therefore, we are, uh, have to be careful to let grow the solution in, in both uh, dimensions. That was it really for short for my presentation, and uh, I made it in 15 minutes, so we have 15 minutes time to discuss things and have questions. Yeah? If not, I give Thales the speech to open the door. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions and comments? Yeah, my business card I have over there, so take one and we can discuss those later. There are no questions, no comments. Not even looking at all this money flowing around. I found this printing issues really interesting. Please. Uh, can you, this is, come, you, you like to come to the microphone, come on. Um, at what stage is this project? Is there already an agreement between Europe and your company? No. Okay, so you're we're presenting a solution. We are presenting, which, a, we're presenting a solution okay. which has the possibility to integrate. So we use already now, uh, if you were already starting now, always all go to the QRIO webpage and downloading the app. Uh, you already can log in via OpenID, uh, via Apple, Google, or whatever. So and uh, the main idea is to make it simpler for the, for the student and for the organizations that we are also integrating the login features of that so that you as a student can log in into the whole app with your uh, student ID. Yeah. And uh, as we are, um, can connect every card, we not really need to integrate with every card because you have to integrate the card and we can support the payment system. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, it's your stage. More comments, questions? No, okay, well then uh, we ask Alexander to please come on stage. Tell us all about Thales. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, that gives me some more time uh, to talk. <laughs> Maybe um, I think uh, this speech will be a bit different from all the others because my view is more from the industry side, from the enterprise side of the, of the metal. Uh, however, I try to, 
make the connection between educational side and uh, what is state of the art in the industry. Uh, my name is Alexander Niklas. I'm from a company called Thales. Uh, Thales is a, a French uh, company, French enterprise, quite large, doing many things. Uh, um, however, I'm part of a smaller group uh, called Cloud Protection and Licensing, uh, which is yeah, um, right, concentrating on things like uh, data encryption, key management, and uh, identity and access management. Um, I will talk about some of the modern cred ID credential options that usually industries and enterprises use today um, and why they use them. Yeah. Um, I will have a brief uh, overlook on our activities concerning the EU digital ID wallet. Yeah. And we will have some a closer look at some, yeah, or at least two technologies that are, from our point of view, really important for the future which is PKI, yeah? PKI in form of physical cards still, yeah? in form of the EU ID wallet, in form of the e-card system, uh, in form of different, in, in form of smartphones. Uh. However, also the FIDO technology, yeah? not sure if you are aware of that, but I will give you a brief introduction of the technology and why it's so important for the industry. So, um, yeah. Actually, Talos and we as CPL uh, provide a huge portfolio of different authentication options. So you see all kinds of technologies uh, that we provide, and some of them are more relevant and some of them less. And I think we all agree that the left one, the password, is not state of the art. However, I had a lot of several discussions and, and talks uh, to, to different people from, from your side who still rely on passwords for authentication, for remote access, for accessing data, for logging into their PCs. Uh, um, however, in the industry, it's absolutely clear if you go to any cloud application, if you do any remote access uh, things, password is gone. It's no way to use it any longer. Um, there are other technologies that are not seen as, as secure enough, like SMS, uh, because we see um, attacks like uh, SIM swapping and stuff. So for the banking uh, environments, for transactions, uh, it's not seen as safe enough, uh, secure enough uh, any longer. Um, therefore, yeah, there's a new recommendation from different sites, from different institutions, that uh, yeah, technology, authentication technology that you use has to be phishing resistant because that's one of the main attacks that we see in the in, in the in the wild, um, in the in the reality. Because you normally, yeah, it, probably everybody of you got already got a, a, a mail or an SMS message that looks more or less, uh, yeah, uh, legitimate and and yeah, that your bank needs your verification that your payment for Amazon went didn't go through. Please log in, click on this link, log in, and, and see what's going on. Yeah? And most of these things, of course, are phishing attacks. Yeah? So somebody tries to, to make you click on this link, yeah? get to a page that looks like an Amazon login page. However, it's not Amazon. Yeah? And therefore, yeah, you have to prevent people from doing this. Yeah? And that's different organizations recommend use other technologies that are phishing resistant. And actually, all of them mention two different things. It's here, it's called PIV, PIF card. It's more or less the certificate-based authentication. So you use a, a certificate, a form of PKI credential for authentication, or the FIDO standard. These are the two technologies that all of them mention when they talk about phishing resistant authentication. So, hey, what we learned from all the multi-factor authentication options that we provide, we have to clean out several of them again. And what, yeah, is, is, is uh, still available is PKI, FIDO, and more or less some kind of biometric and, and uh, passwordless authentication. And we will have a closer look in, in, into these technologies. 
So the modern ID credential options, yeah, PKI smart cards. Yeah. Smart cards are, yeah, okay, I come over to it. And on USB as, a, as another factor uh, or format, yeah, a form factor yeah, for credentials in the PKI uh, environment. We have FIDO, yeah, FIDO2, yeah, because it's a new implementation of that. Maybe some of you have already heard of the, the term called pass keys. Uh, which is also very relevant uh, information. And there are lots of <laughs> meta abbreviations, three letter words, uh, HSM, TPM, TEE, yeah. and that's all tech, yeah, uh, standards or, or components uh, that are relevant if you use your PC, your smartphone, your smart device to store credentials, to store keys uh, in a secure way because we can't handle uh, keys and, and credentials in the same way as we, hand, as we handle data. Yeah? We store data somewhere on the smartphone, in a, in a database, in, in the storage, in the file system. However, we can't store credentials in the same way because we have to, it has to be more secure yeah, than, than other, stu other stuff. Yeah. We have form factors yeah, like smart cards, USB tokens, yeah, and we have these electronic devices, smart devices that hold credentials as well. One of the terms that often occurs uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this area is uh, the term passwordless. Yeah? Just want to briefly make you think about what passwordless means. Yeah? Um, passwordless means, in the first place, there's no static password involved. Yeah? So the, nothing um, that is static that, that authenticates you, but it, it always has to be dynamic in, in a certain way. Yeah? So nobody can just steal your, your credential, your password, can use it in the same way that, as you do, because you need some kind of further, I, yeah, um, further thing, further device uh, to help you to do this authentication procedure. And don't, um, um, yeah, mix it up with the, the a term that is also relevant in this area called PIN, the personal identity number. And I guess most of you already can know it because you unlock your phone, uh, unless you do it with your bio biometric uh, uh, means, or you enter your PIN if you go to the bank uh, machine uh, to get money, you always enter a PIN. And uh, the difference between these two things, the password and the PIN is, the PIN is always verified locally. You enter it into the machine, however, the verification takes place on your bank card, yeah? mainly. Yeah? Whereas when you enter a password to log into your uh, website, a web service, you enter the, the password, the password is sent over the line, online, to the service provider, and the service provider checks if the password was correct. So it's always sent across the line, yeah? it's always the same information, and therefore, it's really dangerous uh, to do this, uh, to, to do authentication that way. Um, and maybe, yeah, what you also know, mainly from your smart devices, if you unlock your smartphone, always entering the PIN would be quite un inconvenient, especially if the PINs get longer and longer and more complex, um, because you can replace it or at least, um, yeah, um, add uh, some kind of biometric authentication. In the main cases, uh, or most of the cases, it's just a convenience uh, topic. Yeah? Because you can always say, okay, I don't want to use my face ID to unlock my phone, but I just use my PIN to unlock it. Yeah? So it's not, a, not, not so much a security thing, but it's, a, it's more a convenience thing, so that it's quite easy to just unlock your phone. Yeah. And we see this in different areas because for example, we, always, uh, we also provide, in this case, it's a, a FIDO smart card, and on the right-hand side, the gray area is a fingerprint reader. Yeah? And we also provide such a card uh, in form of a credit card, yeah? so you can, instead of entering the PIN, you just press your finger on the card, you tap it to your payment, uh, um, payment device, and you, you immediately get the transaction. Yeah, without entering the PIN, just by providing the fingerprint, yeah, which is also more convenient than having to enter the PIN. It's, it's faster, it's, yeah. It's like paying with Apple Pay, for example, just clicking your, 
your, your, your, um, uh, your, your, your button and, and just holding it against the payment terminal and it's done. Yeah? It's quick and fast and easy. Yeah, we still use and sell a lot of PKI smart cards. Yeah? The technology is proven, it's well known, um, it's really established, yeah? it's relying on technology that, it's, that is quite, quite old, yeah? PKI, certification authority, CAs, uh, um, you use your PIN for authentication yeah, to, to, to verify in a multi-factor authentication way that you are in possession of the card. Yeah. The interesting thing is, an interesting part, it already allows several different cryptographic use cases. Yeah. So it supports the authentication process. Yeah. If you want to log in to your website, to your service, you can, you can use it to log into your uh, PC, for example, with a certificate. Uh, it's already there because it's an established technology. However, you can also use it to, to encrypt data. Yeah? You can use it to encrypt uh, your emails, for example. You can encrypt uh, data on your, on your file system. Uh, all of this can be done with certificates as well. So it's more than just authentication. Yeah? And what you can also do is use it for signatures as well. Yeah? We have seen the e-signature stuff and so signatures, um, you, for electronic documents, for PDF files, for emails, uh, is quite important also in the industry. And it's quite flexible yeah, concerning the configuration. We come to bit this uh, a bit later. Now to a more, yeah, a newer kind of uh, thing. Well, it's not that new actually, because uh, FIDO is a standard that's, that's uh, quite old, in, in fact. Uh, it was the first standard was created in 2014. Yeah? So it's already uh, quite some time. Yeah? The interesting thing is, is that it's secure. Yeah? Um, the main thing that and the security comes from one of the aspects that are a problem in the phishing. If we, if we talk about phishing attacks. I talked about this yeah, a few minutes ago. So you get your mail, there's a link in it and it makes you click on the link and uh, assume or makes you believe that this is the login page of Amazon. So if you don't have a close look at uh, the browser line, at the URL of this, of this service, you might yeah, go and enter your credentials. However, it is a fake server yeah, and your credentials are now gone to the attacker. Yeah? That's a, a real big problem. However, as I said, FIDO takes into account the URL of this application. So if you log into a service, the, the URL of this service is taken together with other cryptographic credentials to authenticate the user. And as soon as this URL changes in any way, so if you click on a phishing link, you, you always get a different URL. It is not the same URL as Amazon has, for example. And therefore, the authentication will fail. Whatever happens, yeah, it will not go through. Nobody can misuse this to attack a user in that way. And that's really a benefit uh, over most of the other technologies that we've seen. And this is why it's so important uh, in the industry, and why it's so important for the future to have such a phishing-resistant technology in place. There's another thing that might be interesting because part of the standard is that you have to prove that you actually are physically there during the transaction. So whenever there's a transaction, there, if you want to log in to a web page, to a service, you actually have to, end to, to, to touch the device and say, okay, I'm here, I'm currently sitting in front of my PC, right there, and I want to log in right now. And what this solves is a problem that we always also have uh, in many situations. So let's assume there's an open session on your, on your PC and somebody, somebody uh, can achieve to log into your PC in the background and cover, uh, take control over the session. So you can steal your session you know, or can log in and see your screen. And that's an attack scenario. That's normally an internal attacker can, can normally do. You know. However, he will not be able to use your PC to log in to another service from there because 
He can trigger the authentication process with FIDO as well. However, he will never be able to push and touch the device in the moment of the transaction because he's physically not there. He's only there on a remote, in a remote session. So this is another thing that, that helps to, to improve security in this area. And with pin authentication as well, so it's normally it's an optional thing. So if this, the service provider doesn't want to have the pin because it's secure enough due to other means, it's fine. But if the service provider wants, to, wants you to enter the pin, then you have to enter the pin and to, to, to have some kind of multi-factor authentication, not just having the, the FIDO device uh, with you, but also are in possession or knowledge of the pin that belongs to this card or this, or this token. It's convenient, yeah, because you just need to plug in, you need to enter your pin, yeah, optionally, and you need to touch the device and you're logged in. Yeah, no long passwords, no, I don't think, yeah, no, no complex uh, processes that you have to follow. It's, it's quite easy. And it's universal because you don't need any driver, anything additional, no tools, because all current operating systems like Windows, like Apple, like the smart devices, yeah, iOS systems, iPad, all of them already support this kind of technology out of the box, which makes it quite yeah, interesting for many companies because they need, don't need to do any additional and changes in their configuration. So let's, we now have some, some physical things uh, uh, in, in place. Yeah, we have smart cards, we have USB tokens. However, the smart devices don't have such things in place. Yeah? So they are equipped, however, with, with small components yeah, built into the devices that help you yeah, to, to get more security out of this uh, device. And one of the, the, the bigger devices is the so-called hardware security mod module, the HSM. Actually, Talos is a provider of one of the, the main uh, products in this area, yeah? because hardware security modules are in place for many, many use cases. Because if a service provider, for example, uh, is, is providing a, a CA service, a certificate authority service, he needs to store his certificates in a really secure way. Uh, and this device, it's a hardware appliance. Yeah? Normally, it's attached via network and it securely stores really important key material certificates uh, and, and keys. But it's a, a, a huge component. It's normally built into a rack. Uh, it's an appliance system uh, that uh, is in place. More uh, on, the, on the client side is the so-called TPM, the Trusted Platform Module. And nearly, maybe all of you already have such a device because it's part of any Microsoft uh, notebook it's part of any desktop PC yeah, because it's a really important part for many operating systems. So, for example, Windows 11 doesn't boot up if, not, if such a device is not uh, uh, available. So it's an integral part of the integrity of the operating system already um, that, that nothing can boot on a device without a TPM yeah, because all of the security of the operating system is part of this, uh, of this module. Yeah. Um, the trusted execution environment yeah, is normally a component that is built into all, um, the main processor of your, of your PC. Yeah? Um, it's another form of how or where credentials can be stored, where cryptographic operations can be performed in a secure way. And we also know uh, or hear often a word called secure element. Yeah? It's, it's also a really small part of the, of the device, yeah? for example, in your iPhone, your smartphone, a really small component that stores key material, that, 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 that makes sure that the, if you need um, random numbers, for example, that random numbers are created in a really good way. Yeah? Because that's a real important problem in cryptography. If you don't have good random numbers, yeah? you don't have good cryptography. Yeah? All of these components, and, and there are several more, yeah, are important if you do some kind of virtualization of any physical device, yeah, because you need something in the back end, in, the back, in your device, yeah, to, to get more security on the key material. 
There are some sources, yeah. Please have a look into if you need more information. Yeah, you will all get a slide, so. I will briefly talk about our activities in the EU digital ID wallet. We already heard from Maya and uh, was, uh, Vincente yeah, uh, about the, the wallet system. Yeah. So I will jump over some of the slides because you already know about that yeah, from this presentation. Yeah. Main idea is you have, imagine that you have a, a big, big, big wallet yeah, with all the credit cards and uh, ID cards and passport, passport, driving license, whatever you, you think of, yeah, and you can want to get rid of it yeah, by just replacing it with an application on your smartphone. That's the main problem here, or the idea. It should be very flexible. Yeah? You should selectively be able to disclose information about your identity, yeah? like attributes about your, how old are you? Yeah? Uh, uh, I don't know, different things. Yeah? It should work cross-border, uh, yeah? so it, it should be uh, an EU-wide system. Yeah? Everybody, every country should uh, be able to verify. Yeah? Um, and it should be, um, it, sh it should cover data privacy as aspects as well. The project started, yeah, we, we all know about the, the things uh, already heard from Maya. Um, so I will just jump over to what we do as Talos. Yeah. Um, we are part of several of these pilots already in place. Yeah. So there are huge pilots, uh, four of them uh, um, were mentioned by Maya already, and we are part of two of them, uh, which I'll um, come over that. There are different use cases where, where we can use the EU digital ID wallet, and this is only a small part of, of what actually should, should be implemented in this, uh, in this wallet system. Uh, there are many use cases, many things that, that, uh, that we want to solve with this, uh, and um, yeah, you heard about the status of the project, so earliest uh, 2025, yeah? so uh, let's see what happens. Yeah? Um, however, all this of this is based on technology that was already developed before, because there are already standards uh, available. One of them is the ISO standard here mentioned uh, that, that was uh, designed for, um, yeah, um, uh, authentication and, 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 and um, uh, identity systems yeah, that cover the features and, and things that are now part of the EU digital ID wallet. Yeah. And we see also from the standardization organization W3C, uh, which does mainly stuff in the, in the web environment, uh, the so-called verifiable credentials. Uh, this is also something that, that is Base, uh, that is the base technology and base, uh, base standard that all the digital wallet activities are based on. Yeah. So not everything is new, yeah? so we re rely on existing uh, standards and technologies. Why are we as Talos uh, part of this, uh, this development? Actually, we are working on this uh, quite a long time. We all also heard that the uh, EU digital ID wallet is part of the so-called EIDAS um, standard, which is more the identity focus, yeah? so the authentication, the, um, the signature part of the, uh, the, um, the technology. And we were working really hard on the EIDAS 1 uh, um, form, format uh, and standard, so we were part of the development. And we all now are also working with companies and industries and governments for the, the new standard as well. So we are part of this, all this, all this uh, development of standards. Yeah, and here are the two projects that we are involved with, the pilots, uh, the potential, and the NOBIT project. So actually, Thales is actively working for uh, yeah, um, 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 an implementation of the wallet system in different areas for different use cases. Uh, together with many other companies with different uh, countries. Uh, so yeah, we are part of the development. Here are a lot of sources, uh, if you need more information about that, most of them from our side, but other uh, sources as well. Yeah, you will get one take picture. So.
Your chance? Your chance? <laughs> but you will get the information as well. Yeah, so it's part of the, the things you will get after the, the conference. And now I will uh, go over, yeah. What's the time? Oh, still good. <laughs> um, we will go over the two technologies that I already mentioned so about these phishing resistant technologies that the industry actually likes because of yeah, the, the, the good security that they provide. One of them is the PKI, so the smart cards and USB token stuff. And I just want to go briefly about how flexible is the, this uh, technology. Yeah. So on the one hand side, um, we, the normal card that you know, like your bank card, normally looks like that or used to look like that. You have a plastic card yeah, and you have a, a golden chip on it. Yeah, and this is the, actually the, the chip, the, the logical chip with a contact um, plate. Yeah, and you need a, a reader, a contact reader, to get to communicate with this device. Yeah. However, there are also cards that, um, that have an antenna inside. So you don't, normally don't see it. Yeah, it's part of the... It's, it's inside of the plastic uh, uh, coating, um, and you use it for contactless communication with the card. Uh, it could be NFC, uh, we've already heard that today, the near field communication technology, or you may have heard from physical access cards, uh, um, then it's called RFID, RFID communication. Um, we have heard about the MyFair Deskfire and MyFair Classic uh, uh, previously. Yeah, and about problems uh, these technologies might have. So it's for door access systems, for time uh, um, things, uh, for entry systems, physical access cards. Yeah. These are, these look like this. Yeah. And then we have hybrid cards because we can combine both technologies. So we have a, 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 a crypto chip, yeah, which is completely separate, however, from the antenna for the NFC or um, RFID chip yeah, for physical access, for example. And we can combine it in another way, because there are technologies as well to have a physical chip that can be used in a contact mode. However, with the dual interface, you can also use an NFC reader to communicate in a contactless way. So it's a combination of two technologies within one logical crypto chip. So you see it's, it's quite flexible, depending on the needs and requirements of, of the customer. Yeah? we can provide all these combinations in different ways. And then you normally have some kind of printing on it. We also have provide cards that you might know from, from other multi-factor authentication solutions. So this is a card that by pressing a, a button, um, it creates a one-time passcode to log in to, an auth, to, a, to a website, for example. So we have means to, to, to have an, a display inside the card. Yeah? Um, to create one-time token codes. And we also have cards that combine different things. You can have different security features for the visible part. It can be some kind of, uh, of, of uh, enterprise uh, um, yeah, visual um, yeah, exosystem. Yeah? So you can verify, you can print uh, uh, yeah, some things on it, yeah, whatever you like. And also what's quite interesting, yeah, uh, all these PKI technologies can also be provided in form of a virtual smart card. And the, the base idea, I don't want to go over the details, but the base idea is the cryptographic keys that you use for your um, PKI transactions, for your cryptographic transactions, are not in the computer or any physical card, but they are, they, they are remaining in a network-based hardware security module. And all cryptographic requests are handed over using a network connection from your client PC to this network HSM. HSM. Yeah. So cryptographic functions are, are performed on the HSM and the result is sent back to the client. And so you can do yeah, quite secure cryptographic transactions without having a physical device with you. That's quite interesting for some use cases. 
Let's quickly go over FIDO, yeah, because FIDO is a technology that's, that's interesting. As I said, it's, it was already created uh, and defined 2014, so it's quite old, um, in the version 1.0. Um, actually, the main drivers were, uh, during this time, PayPal. We already held about this service as well. Yeah? They, they did want to do uh, transactions with money, and they already saw there's a problem with authentication using passwords, yeah? doing transactions this way. So they wanted to have more security. Together with Google, they defined the standard. Yeah? However, the standard did not really get into, yeah, it wasn't visible, yeah? so there were many companies actually who contributed to the standard. Yeah? However, with uh, newer technologies, with companies like Microsoft providing or offering their cloud uh, systems, uh, this technology and this standard gets more and more traction uh, in the field. Uh, the idea is, as I already said, it's quite, quite interesting because the, the, the main components that are relevant for this technology are already built into your, your computer. Yeah? Because what you need is, you need some kind of component yeah, the, called CTAP, uh, the, the, uh, this uh, client to authenticator um, uh, protocol, which communicates between the FIDO token, uh, that might be a USB token or a smart card, or and your device. Yeah? So that's one part of the thing. The other one is an API that you can use for the authentication process. Yeah? And all of this is already implemented and it's already there. Yeah? Okay, so a new form of FIDO credential is called passkeys. And passkeys are quite interesting because they are already built into your smart devices. They use the technology and the protocol that was defined by FIDO, but they use it in a smarter way. Yeah? And uh, they use it in the same way as you would use other credentials. Yeah? So it's quite easy to handle. It's already built in your device, uh, and you can immediately use it for many services already. And now the connection to the EUDI wallet application, because the FIDO Alliance, which is the, the, the standardization uh, organization behind FIDO, um, already mentioned the EU Digital ID wallet as one of the applications that might be relevant uh, for FIDO technology. Yeah? And it covers some of some use cases where FIDO authentication might be an in integral part of the implementation of this, uh, uh, of this EU ID wallet system and framework. Yeah? Because they also see, okay, there's a really good authentication technology uh, and then we can use it for other use cases as well. Yeah, yeah. more sources. Uh, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. I'm laughing because I was looking at your slides and I was projecting myself. I'm a boomer. So now, thanks for scaring a lot of hell of me because now I need to go back and change all my passwords. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, and then I'm also thinking of all these FIDO and then how do you defeat my wife having your cell phone, no battery, or losing the cell phone. So I'm looking at it, I'm like, okay, this is beautiful. But thanks a lot. I mean, it's, uh, it's really amazing. Uh, I saw people actually taking pictures of the big wallet. So the, when the big wallet came up, and this, people started looking at it and taking pictures. So we have lots of resources here. Um, and thank you, it was really detailed, and, and uh, it gave us really a good impression of what technology can achieve and how we can tap this technology into the applications for the ESC, uh, together with the payment system, together with the work that NTT is doing. Um, and it's really interesting to see that you can really relate to different things and different applications. So it's really interesting to see how technology can actually be embedded in all of this. Uh, questions, comments, reactions, apart from the funny one, two, three, four, five password. Everybody's changing their passwords now. I'm scared like hell. <laughs> Any comments? I mean, the, all the higher education institutions and you guys are issuing cards and using these technologies. Is this helping, intimidating? Is it looking at a new dimension and what is the future holding for us? No comments. Okay. So then uh, maybe we want to start um, inviting. Uh, any other comments from uh, 
the other panelists and looking at all these technologies, this is all stuff that you know already, that's okay. Um, so maybe we want to move forward and go into a closure. And um, how about Tamash, you come back on stage and we look at the different things and uh, together with Henry, you want to sit down and you know we can just start drawing a bit of the conclusions, concluding remarks, key takeaways of the day. Um, this is a culmination, this event is a culmination. We had training sessions yesterday. Uh, we have the technology providers, the universities, the service providers, and so on. Um, what are the um, key takeaways that you want to start drawing from what we discussed yesterday during the training sessions, today during the exchange, the future of the policy initiatives, the digital wallet, and so on. Oop. Okay, um, any questions in the audience? Uh, nothing? <laughs> okay, yeah. A question for the two uh, digital wallet projects. If I understood well, you're involved in two projects that were just recently funded. Could you tell us more about those and what the specific objectives or differences are between these two initiatives? For us to understand a bit what, what's ahead and what, what you're doing in these uh, two projects. Yeah, thanks. Actually, I'm, I'm not involved in these projects. Um, actually, it's not because I, I'm from this cloud protection and licensing business unit. However, the driver for these uh, projects is more in the government and banking side. Uh, so I can uh, yeah, give you the contact yeah, of people being involved, yeah, maybe, um, and, and yeah, make sure that you get uh, more information about that if you're interested in it. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yep. Right. I don't think uh, both of these projects didn't contain any any educational uh, parts, as far as I saw, yeah, and so I can't say any further. Yeah. So I suppose that most of you who are from uh, the higher education sector um, are in the uh, business to some sometime in the future go to the e-card. And um, one problem we discussed today is um, if you have some kind of uh, payment system, um, how can you integrate that um, into an e-card? So have you have a payment system on, on, on for example, a MyPerdesfire card or some kind of other uh, smart card, NFC smart card? And this is a very, very, very common uh, thing for, for uh, high education institutions in Germany. And you want to go to an e-card because not only e-cards are cool, but they are, more, they are cheaper than, than physical cards and also much, much better for the environment. So, um, and this is, I think for, the, for most, most projects, uh, almost a showstopper, especially because um, if you have seen my presentation yesterday, um, in the Android world, there are solutions. There are solutions, workarounds. Either you can use Google Wallet or you can build something yourself, what we done here in Berlin, or you can license from NXP, uh, MyFair to go, for example, for MyFair Desfire. Um, so you have options. It's a, it's a matter of taste, money, and, uh, and um, resources, human resources you have. As for the, from the iOS world, and this means half of your students, or at least almost half of your students, you are essentially chained to Apple. So, um, and the problem is that Apple is holding the big end of the chain, and the other end is on your, uh, on your shoulders. So, um, essentially you have only the solutions Apple are providing you, and the problem is, um, this is, this has not come up today, but yesterday, there was a lively discussion about this. Um, Currently, there is 
from Apple, from the Apple side, outside of the North American market, the US market, there is no solution, absolutely none, which you can use. So if you have an iPhone, you have, and you want a digital card into the iPhone with NFC that will work like your ca uh, card, there is no solution. There is a solution, a workaround, uh, my colleague here uh, presented today, um, but no direct solution. So, um, you're not fine with that? So I'm not alone here, as you've seen. I uh, also have another Dutch colleague, Robin, with me, because when my technical know-how is uh, ending, then he can start uh, jumping into. So he, he, he's behind you, so if you have a technical question on that. Um, first of all, I met 2019, uh, the director of development from Transact, the former Blue Coat uh, company in the US. So they are developing this uh, wallet uh, with, with Apple. So you can see a lot of advertising from them. They say they have one and a half thousand universities under their umbrella. But what they're not telling, that uh, Transact paid 3.3 million US dollar for it, that Apple is moving their backside uh, to open the doors. If you're now uh, going to the Apple uh, support web pages, they are already saying that's available. Because they're saying, and you get even a German documentation about it, that you can download an app to use it. The problem is that they only have the app for the US market. So to solve that, uh, we integrated uh, a QR code solution, so it works with uh, old mobile phones and new mobile phones and even on a plastic card if you want. Uh, but additional to that, we are of course working on, on a uh, solution that we also can make a workaround on Apple. And we have made a showcase in one of the other payment systems uh, areas I showed on my slides in the public transport. And there we they turned the trick around. So what we're doing is there, we're making the uh, reader so the, the, we're making the phone to the reader and we're making the reader on the other side to the card. And that's the trick how we are, can uh, go around uh, the wallet on Apple. And it gives a lot of potential uh, for developing solutions. So if you technical guys want to have more questions on that, then uh, Robin will answer probably. But uh, uh, this is for now the, the information. Probably end of the year you will see uh, something more on that. We are already in, in the dive with Apple. Uh, to discuss it, we out the outcome we have to see then. Junge, junge, junge! That I, I was expecting this question, Robin. You need to help me. Hello, everyone. So I'm Robin, uh, working for Quario, the solution Henry uh, talked about. Um, so the problem with uh, iOS is um, you need to have. Um, uh, Apple will work with you to, uh, to be able to load a, a card scheme on the phone. Uh, there's a company that paid a lot of money for it, and you need to be approved. Uh, you know, the, Apple needs to help you if you uh, want to get implemented. Um, but the way we did it is um, uh, if you have readers, like uh, I've heard uh, the brand Elatech come before us. Um, I used to work for Enepro, also sells readers. Uh, and they can emulate, it's in the NFC protocol, they can emulate, uh, for instance, a MyFair Classic card. So the reader, which is mounted uh, on, a, on a till or on an access system, uh, it can, can emulate the card. And you can use your iPhone to, uh, to scan air tags and, and RFID tags. So uh, you install uh, our app and uh, you trigger it um, to start as a reader, so the application starts searching for tags, you present your phone onto the reader, which is emulating a card. Uh, the card which is generated is a, is a random UID, so you don't actually need uh, a specific card or anything, you just need an API in the cloud which generated that ID, and the app knows who you are, so it tells the server, I've just read this random UID, and my name is Robin, so you know who I am, and I'm at this terminal at the moment. And then you can start doing things, payments, uh, access, uh, all sorts of things. And it works for Android, of, uh, of course, as well. And another thing we're, we're, we're working on, uh, because um, there are some new improvements on that as well, is, is, is uh, BLE, so Bluetooth Low, low Energy. Uh, in the past, uh, Bluetooth sends out a signal 
and uh, you can pick it up for 10 to 15 meters. But we now have technology where you can uh, uh, yeah, really accurately uh, tell where somebody is. So the reader could say, okay, I, I'm reading some uh, ID which is five centimeters or 10 centimeters away from me. So uh, yeah, you can use that as well. And uh, this technology is, is allowed to use on iOS as well. So there are becoming some alternatives uh, available for iOS. How major is this conversion in terms of usability? Uh... The, the hardware needs to support it, of course. So the, the readers uh, need to be able to emulate the cards. And of course, you need a, a solution uh, which yeah, can, can handle the, uh, yeah, the, the communication. Yeah, and the other advantage above uh, QR codes is if you have a printed QR code, um, there is no feedback to the user. The same goes as if you have a, an offline QR code on your phone, uh, your phone would need some kind of um, communication with a server to hear your code has be, been read. But with the BLE and the uh, uh, NFC method, you can actually give feedback to the user on his phone uh, without using the internet, because there's a two-way communication. So that's the main advantage. All right, you're welcome. Thank you, thank you. Um, actually, I have more questions. Okay, it, it, it's turning into a technical panel. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, it sounds great. It sounds actually awesome. Um, I see only one little problem. So that the problem that we don't, that you don't need, um, or the, the advantage that you don't need uh, internet or don't need a network, um, I don't see it as a big advantage because in a university environment you have everywhere I do roam. So that's that's not the big big deal. Um, the big deal is can you. Yeah, you ha Edurom works in this room. The, the problem is the burden free Wi-Fi. Um, the um, other thing, um, is there a list of readers um, which are compatible? Um, because the problem, what I see, is if you have a, like in here in Berlin, you have a, a big Studentenwerk with I don't know how many, a thousand uh, cash desks um, across the city. Um, I cannot tell them, I cannot go to them and tell, okay, you have to change all your readers um, they were actually not very enthusiastic um, seven or eight years ago when we started, when 2016, when we started the campus card and they had to change to MyFair Testfire. They had a MyFair Classic system before that. And uh, they had to update the software in all of their readers. They were like, oh man, what a mess, we have to do this and it costs money. And if, if someone goes to them and says, okay, we have to change all the readers because they are, your readers are stupid and you need intelligent readers which can be programmed, um, I'm pretty sure that a Studentenwerk will say no. It works that way. It, it has been working for the last 20 years. I'm happy with it and that's that. So that, that I see as a, as a little problem in this. But it's still on? Yeah. That's right, but the technology this um, provider using here is very old. So uh, at, when that was developed, I think some people are really writing uh, on Schiefer Tafeln, or as we say in as we say in Germany. So it's an it's an old, uh, outdated system. To solve this problem, that's why we said we are using uh, QR code because uh, the QR code we also can implement to the cash register without the reader, just 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 by a sticker. So we can we can just put a sticker to the cash register, and then via the network and via the server, we can do the payment. So that's why we use uh, the uh, QR code technology as a bridge. The same we can do for the vending machine. In the vending machine, we have a small, uh, small uh, uh, controller. So for every coffee machine, uh, 20 years old vending machine, which, which understand MDB, we just can plug in this box. We can let in the payment system as it is today, but we can additional add a QR code or another reader. We even can bridge it with an open loop reader. So if you are a um, university, which has a lot of guests, which is a trend at, at the Studentenwerke that they're inviting also people from the street just for eating and drinking. We can also add a normal banking reader to it, then re you really can support all kinds of payment methods and we can register and giving the report uh, to that. And for the multifunctionals, to make it round, there, there's no reader needed anymore. So because uh, in our solution, we have a plugin which runs directly on the multi multifunctional 
and that's connected to the mobile phone or to the university card. This sounds great. And this actually, I think this is the solution. This is the, the, the real solution which, which might get traction, enough traction to, um, to help us out. So for example, here in Berlin and probably also at other um, universities in Germany. So this, um, just a question to the audience. Use. Yeah, still, uh, yeah, now. Um, so, question to the audience. I, I'm uh, about Germany and some countries, I'm pretty sure that there are uh, a lot of closed loop payment systems. But um, who in the audience, it, aside from Germany, where I know that there are actually there, uh, has a closed loop payment system? So, a cashless payment system in their university. Um, in Italy, yes. France, I know, easily. And outside Italy, France, and Germany, Netherlands. Netherlands, that you have to top it all up, so, or, or, or so you don't use your Visa card, your Mastercard, or, or your normal wallet system, but you have a, a dedicated card uh, for the payment of, of whatever food, washing machine, laundry automat, um, printing, copying what you ever pay at the university, inside a university, um, and you cannot use normal money, either as, as money, as cash, or, you can, or cards, or uh, like a Visa card, or MasterCard, but you have to have a special, topped up, closed system. So you go to a machine, top it up, or, or, or you put top it up through your bank account, but it is a, it is a separate system, just for the university. And you're from Belgium. Am I right? Yes. And Luxembourg. Luxembourg also. So that, that, sorry? Ah. Okay, so it's, it's in a lot of countries. It's not like it's just they put some money on their account and they can just print stuff. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's for printing at your university. Okay. So for example, here in Berlin, you can print, copy with it, you can pay your library uh, overview fees and eat with it. And if you are living in a um, housing from the Studentenwerk, you can also use the washing machine with it. And it's not a cost, it's just that they put it on their account and then they log in with their password. And ah, okay. Their is it's with money. That's no, that's... No, that's you, you see it. You see it in uh, in some countries uh, where a student's not getting a special discount. So in in the Benelux, uh, they have this uh, pin solution. So you pay with your bank card because there's no difference if you're a student or a guest. So you don't need the advantage of of the discount or of the of the APIs. So therefore, the most of the uh, usage in the Benelux countries is uh, using our system for copy print. So you you load your your print wallet. Uh, but there will be coming new ways also in the Netherlands now, so that's why the University of Wageningen uh, is changing that because they want to give the advantage of discount, so they want to support the students, so they are defining it. Um, and uh, they also now bringing in into our app the first um, uh, student card, so they really, that what Tamas is doing in his own app, we can integrate in our app, and the other way around, we can uh, also give uh, the APIs that you just can connect in, in your app, so you don't need to have you, to use our app. Uh, and uh, they integrated and for, as I said, for vending and everything. So you have many years in the Benelux, the trend go away from a closed loop system because you have the chip knip and other kind of payment methods, but they're not there anymore. And now MasterCard, Visa card and all of them, they're raising a bit uh, the, the, the conditions. So therefore it's a relaunch of, of these new systems. That's what we see in the market right now. Thank you. Are there any more questions uh, regarding this topic? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yesterday you talked about Apple requiring uh, Apple for higher education if you want to do payments. So uh, today I learned about the closed loop, open loop question. Uh, so Apple requires you for both. For closed loop as well, they require Apple for higher education? Because just the way I see it, so open loop is you transfer real money with your visa, but closed loop is 
you just do a transaction within an internal system and then you do real payments. Okay. For, for open loop, as if your bank supports or the bank who issued the card supports uh, Apple Wallet, there is no problem. You go through that and that's it. Um, for the closed loop is the problem. That's the problem because closed loop systems are normally not supported by Apple. So there are some uh, outside of Europe, but not in not that, that I know of. Um, and open loop is normal. So if the bank supports it, it's okay. If the bank does not support it, then you're out of luck. So I, I, I don't know about Apple, someone who has Apple Wallet, I have a, have a Google phone. With Google, for example, Google Wallet, you can have a workaround. If your bank doesn't support Google Wallet for your card, you can use a PayPal as a, as a, as a workaround. If PayPal is supported by, uh, by um, Google for the wallet. It generates a, a MasterCard, a, a virtual MasterCard with PayPal logo on it. And you can put PayPal, a MasterCard or Visa card behind PayPal and so integrate, you can integrate a, a German uh, Maestro card, which is not supported by Google. So you, essentially you can integrate anything through PayPal. I don't know about Apple. So if someone could, uh, who uses Apple Wallet, is, it, is this working in with Apple? Yes? So in the Apple Wallet, um, of course you can use Apple Wallet with every credit card and uh, everyone who has a uh, German Sparkassen <laughs> card, they are happy because then also the Giro card uh, can be used. But you cannot add different uh, uh, user rights. What we're doing in the product Wirepay you have seen uh, in the Nordic, in the Scandinavian, uh, they're using the trick of, of, uh, uh, of Apple of open loop payment but you have to register yourself first. You have to put your card somewhere and then we know that's you. And uh, <laughs> then we're using the normal payment way. So you are uh, pay with your open uh, payment method, but we know that you are a student and uh, you get your discounts. But uh, if you do this uh, in, in, in Germany, which are all the micro payments, because when we're talking about payments in our business, then we're talking in an average uh, bond from uh, two euro 50, even less, so you pay for a coffee, five cents, you pay for a coffee, a euro. Uh, meanwhile, we have the new sto stories again that you have to rent your, your cup and you have to give the cup back. So all this goes uh, via a vending machine. So, and this all to the micropayments. And when you account always the 1.8% plus the disaster fee of a credit card to a 25 cent or something, so then uh, you better can give the coffee for free. Yeah? So therefore, uh, in some countries it works where the prices are higher and where they have better arrangement with MasterCard and Visa. Uh, but otherwise we are, uh, have to work with a closed loop system to hold for the student and work at the cost down and also for the students down. That's, if you noticed here, um, that's why some, um, some vendors doesn't, do not accept uh, Visa and MasterCard under like 10 euros, 15 euros, 20 euros, 25 euros. So you have to, they accept, however, the German Maestro cards, which no one else uses outside of Germany. And I, and I, if I read correctly, they are also phased out by, by Master, MasterCard. Oh, okay. It's a side note. So essentially that's the, what Henry said, that's, the, that's why Germany is a very curious place and you cannot use your, your Visa and MasterCard in the Studentenberg. Any, any more questions? More questions about other topics which we talked about today? Or questions uh, for Alexander or Henry? Yes, back there. So what's actually the fallback for people that don't have a smartphone in this new world that we say we emulate the uh, NFC and read it with a smartphone? That's a good question. You're one of them? No. <laughs> I mean, I mean you, you all work in universities, right? You have in the, in the average 30,000 to 50,000 students there. And uh, everyone has something, it's called uh, Studentrat, or in Germany it's called Asta. And at the Asta, you always have one guy who has no mobile phone, he's against everything. So what do you do with that guy? For that guy, we have developed a web page so he can use his PC, he can use the same technology, and he can still use his university card. So that's why we are not only a mobile payment app, so we are an app which you can use, like your banking app, 
but we still supporting the old, good old classical way of uh, in the uh, university uh, card, and that makes us different to others. We also have still the we call the Rui Lodo or a top-off station, so the expensive metal box on the walls where you put money in or you can upload the card with your bank card. So we have that as well, but we don't want it anymore because it wastes money and nobody's using it in the end. But for that guy, we can hang him that in front of his office, yeah, that he can use it every day he wants to. But you will see, these are the people. We have uh, several installations in Germany, uh, uh, also, for example, the University of Aachen. And in Aachen, um, we have every semester, maybe you have it as well, students which don't want to have a, a card with electronic a chip in it. Yeah? So they say, I don't want to have a chip because we don't know what you put in our data there. But these are the students who are staying then in the queue of the restaurant and complaining to the lady who uh, makes the, the food ready, why I cannot pay with my card here? So yeah, maybe he should study his university study again or he should go somewhere else. But uh, <laughs> we have them, we have them uh, every day, every year. And yeah, sometimes we have to ignore them. So. Is that the answer? Yeah. Unfortunately, every big German university has that problem. So it's, it's like 5% or so of the students who are mm. special kind. And they have big problems. Of course. <laughs> Probably they also have a smartphone and um, a new one, but they don't want to use, this, uh, for example, their smartphone for their e-card. And they will refuse to use that. So, for example, we will, um, for the next five to ten years, we will still offer them the, the physical card. It doesn't mean that the physical card has the same benefits for them as the virtual card. It doesn't mean that they get the physical card middle of the night on a, a Saturday. Um, they will have to wait until Monday and uh, on, in work time, so Monday sometimes in the in the later morning hours, they will get an answer and they get a card. Yep. It's a little bit inconvenient, but that's, that's life. Either you evolve or you, are, are, you have an inconvenient life. So that's, that's that. Any more questions? So if there are no more questions, I suppose, we can, we can uh, wrap it up and close it, it. First of all, by thanking uh, Humboldt University of Berlin Thank for their much. fantastic or hospitality and the great organization of the training yesterday, the final event today. A couple of announcements. Uh, you have seen we have many resources, many presentations, um, so much knowledge here. Everything will be put up on the website of the conference and then all the participants that registered will receive an email with a link, secure link, uh, where they can access, <laughs> I've learned a lesson or two, uh, where they can access all the information and sharing all the information. Um, also another uh, administrative announcement, those of you who requested a printed certificate of attendance for whatever purpose, you can relate to uh, the volunteers. Again, a great thank you to the volunteers at the, at the desk and fetch your certificate of attendance. I want to thank all the panelists for their very interesting presentations. And most importantly, you, the attendees, for your patience, your participation, and your active involvement in these couple of days. And thanks again to the organizer Tamash and all the, the staff that has worked with him and most importantly the volunteers who really made this happen. And thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo.